Chapter 15 of The Young Carthaginian. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Arnie Horton. The Young Carthaginian. A Story of the Times of Hannibal. By George Alfred Henty. Chapter 15. A Mountain Tribe. It is a petty place for a chief of any power, Trebon said. Yes, Malchus agreed. But I fancy these hill tribes are broken up into a very large number of small villages in isolated valleys, only uniting when the order of the chief calls upon them to defend the mountain against an invader or to make a simultaneous raid upon the plains. As they neared the village, several persons were seen to issue out from the gate, and among these was a small and elderly man, evidently the chief of the party. His white hair descended to his waist. A boy standing behind him carried his bow and several javelins. The rest of the men appeared to be unarmed. He is a crafty-looking old fellow, Malchus said, as he alighted and advanced towards the chief but I suppose he has made up his mind to receive us as friends, at any rate for the present. I come, chief, as an ambassador from the Carthaginian general. When we passed south, he received messengers from you, saying that you were ready to enter into a alliance with him. To this he agreed, and sent presents. Since then you have done nothing, although he has sent to you urging you to aid him by making an attack on the tribes allied to Rome. In every battle which he has fought with the Romans, he has defeated them with great slaughter. But owing to the aid which they have received from the tribes in alliance with them, they are enabled continually to put fresh armies in the field. Therefore it is that he has sent me to you, and to the other chiefs of the tribes inhabiting the mountains, to urge you to descend with your forces into the plains, and so oblige the tribes there to turn their attention to their own defense, rather than to the sending of assistance to Rome. He has sent by my hands many valuable presents, and has authorized me to promise you, in his name, such lands as you may wish to obtain beyond the foot of the hills. He promises you also a share in the booty taken at the sack of the Italian cities. Will you please to enter, the chief said, speaking a patois of Latin, which Malchus found it difficult to understand. We will then discuss the matters concerning which you speak. So saying, he led the way through the gates to a hut somewhat larger than the rest. Do you enter with me, Trebon? But let your men remain in their saddle, and hold our horses in readiness for us to mount speedily if there be need. I doubt the friendliness of this old fellow and his people. Upon entering the hut, Malchus observed at once that the walls were covered with hangings, which were new and fresh, and he detected some costly armor half hidden in a corner. The Romans have been here before us, he muttered to his companion. The question is, how high have they bid for his support? The chief took his seat on a roughly carved chair, and seats were brought in for his visitors. He began by asking an account of the state of affairs in the plains. Malchus answered him truthfully, except that he exaggerated a little the effects that the Carthaginian victories had produced among the natives. The chief asked many questions, and was evidently by some means well informed on the subject. He then expressed a desire to see the presents which they had brought him. Trebon went out and returned with two soldiers bearing them. I don't like the look of things, he said in a low voice. The number of men in the village has trebled since we arrived, and they still keep coming in. None of them show arms at present, but no doubt they are hidden close at hand. I believe the chief is only keeping us in conversation, till he considers that a sufficient force has arrived to make sure of us. We can't break it off now, Malchus said, and must take our chance. It would not do to ensure a failure by showing suspicion. 
the chief examined the presents with great care and announced his satisfaction at them then he entered upon the question of the land which he was to receive inquired whether the towns were to be captured by the carthaginians and handed over to him or were to be captured by his forces when these points had been arranged as it seemed satisfactorily he entered upon questions in dispute between himself and other chiefs of the mountain tribes malchus said he had no instructions as to these points which were new to him but that in all questions between the chief and tribes hostile to carthage full satisfaction would be given him as to those between himself and other chiefs who might also join against the romans if they elected to submit them to hannibal for decision he would arbitrate between them at this moment a horn was blown outside a din of voices instantly arose which was followed immediately afterwards by the clashing of weapons malchus and his companion leaped to their feet and rushed from the hut they found that their men were attacked by a crowd of mountaineers in an instant they leaped on their horses and drawing their swords joined in the fray the number of their foes was large a great many men having come in since tribon had last issued out the attack was a determined one those next to the horsemen hewed at them with axes those further back hurled darts and javelins while others crept in among the horses and stabbed them from beneath with their long knives we must get out of this or we are lost Trebon exclaimed and encouraging the men with his shouts he strove to hew a way through the crowd to the gate while malchus faced some of the men round and covered the rear several of the carthaginians were already dismounted owing to their horses being slain and some of them were dispatched before they could gain their feet malchus shouted to the others to leap up behind their comrades by dint of desperate efforts Tribon and the soldiers with him cleared the way to the gate but those behind were so hampered by the enemy that they were unable to follow the natives clung to their legs and strove to pull them off their horses while a storm of blows was hurled upon them Tribon, seeing the danger of those behind had turned and in vain tried to cut his way back to them but the number of the natives was too great Malchus, seeing this, shouted at the top of his voice, Fly, Trebon, you cannot help us. Save those you can. Seeing that he could render his friend no assistance, Trebon turned round and galloped off with nine of the soldiers who had made their way with him to the gate. Five had already fallen, and Malchus shouted to the other six to throw down their arms and yield themselves as prisoners. This they did, but two of them were killed before the villagers perceived they had surrendered. Malchus and the others were dragged from their horses, bound hand and foot, and thrown into one of the huts. The natives shouted in triumph, and yells of delight arose as the packages borne by the baggage animals were examined, and the variety of rich presents intended for the various chiefs divided among them most of the captives were more or less severely wounded and some of the natives presently came into the hut and examined and bound up the wounds keep up your spirits malchus said cheerfully it is evident they don't intend to kill us no doubt they are going to send us prisoners to the romans and in that case we shall be exchanged sooner or later at any rate the romans would not dare ill-treat us for hannibal holds more than a hundred prisoners in his hands to every one they have taken three days passed food was brought to the captives regularly and their bonds were sufficiently relaxed for them to feed themselves at the end of that time they were ordered to rise and leave the hut outside the chief with some forty of his followers were waiting them all were armed and the prisoners being placed in their midst the party started they proceeded by the same road by which malchus had ridden to the village and some miles were passed without incident when as they were passing through a narrow valley a great number of rocks came bounding down the hillside and at different points along it several carthaginians appeared 
In these Malchus recognized at once the soldiers of his escort. One of these shouted out, Surrender, or you are all dead men. A strong force surrounds you on both sides, and my officers whom you see will give orders to their men, who will loose such an avalanche of rocks that you will all be swept away. It is only the men who escaped us, the chief cried. Push forward at once. But the instant the movement began, the Carthaginians all shouted orders, and a great number of rocks came bounding down, proving that they were obeyed by an invisible army. Several of the mountaineers were crushed by the stones, and the old chief, struck by a great rock in the chest, fell dead. A Carthaginian standing next to Malchus was also slain. The tribesmen gave a cry of terror. Hand to hand they were ready to fight valiantly, but this destruction by an unseen foe terrified them. The Carthaginian leader raised his hand, and the descent of the stone ceased. Now, he said, you see the truth of my words. Hesitate any longer, and all will be lost. But if you throw down your arms, and, leaving your captives behind, retire by the way you came, you are free to do so. Hannibal has no desire for the blood of the Italian people. He has come to free them from the yoke of Rome. And your treacherous chief, who, after our making an alliance with him, sold you to the Romans, has been slain. Therefore, I have no further ill will against you. The tribesmen, dismayed by the loss of their chief, and uncertain as to the strength of the foes who surrounded them, at once drew down their arms, and, glad to escape with their lives, fled at all speed up the pass towards their village, leaving their captives behind them. The Carthaginians then descended, Trebon among them. I did not show myself, Malchus, the latter said as he joined his friend, for the chief knew me by sight, and I wished him to be uncertain whether we were not a fresh party who had arrived. But who are your army? Malchus asked. You have astonished me as much as the barbarians. There they are, Trebon said, laughing, as some fifty or sixty women and a dozen old men and boys began to make their way down the hill. Fortunately, the tribesmen were too much occupied with their plunder and you to pursue us, and I got down safely with my men. I was, of course, determined to try to rescue you somehow, but did not see how it was to be done. Then a happy thought struck me, and the next morning we rode down to the plain till we came to a walled village. I at once summoned it to surrender using threats of bringing up a strong body to destroy the place if they refused. They opened the gate sooner than I had expected, and I found the village inhabited only by women, old men, and children, the whole of the fighting men having been called away to join the Romans. They were, as you may imagine, in a terrible fright, and expected every one of them to be killed. However, I told them that we would not only spare their lives, but also their property, if they would obey my orders. They agreed willingly enough, and I ordered all those who were strong enough to be of any good to take each sufficient provisions for a week and to accompany me. Astonished as they were at the order, there was nothing for them to do but to obey, and they accordingly set out. I found by questioning them that the road we had traveled was the regular one up to the village, and that you would be sure to be brought down by it if the chief intended to send you to Rome. By nightfall we reached this valley. The next morning we set to work and cut a number of strong levers. Then we went up on the hillside to where you saw us, and I posted them all behind the rocks. We spent all the day loosing stones and placing them in readiness to roll down, and were then prepared for your coming. At nightfall I assembled them all and put a guard over them. We posted them again at daybreak yesterday, but watched all day in vain, and here we should have remained for a month, if necessary, as I should have sent down some of the boys for more provisions when those they brought were gone. However, I was right glad when I saw you coming today, for it was dull work. 
I would have killed the whole of these treacherous savages if I had not been afraid of injuring you and the men. As it was, I was in terrible fright when the stones went rushing down at you. One of our men has been killed, I see, but there was no help for it. The whole party then proceeded down the valley. On emerging from the hills, Jabon told his improvised army that they could return to their village, as he had no further need of their services, and, delighted at having escaped without damage or injury, they at once proceeded on their way. We had best halt here for the night, Trevon said, and in the morning I will start off with the mounted men and get some horses from one of the villages for the rest of you. No doubt they are all pretty well stripped of fighting men. The next day the horses were obtained, and Malchus, seeing that now he had lost all the presents intended for the chiefs, it would be useless to pursue his mission further, especially as he had learned that the Roman agents had already been at work among the tribes, returned with his party to Hannibal's camp. I am sorry, Malchus, the Carthaginian general said, when he related his failure to carry out the mission, that you have not succeeded, but it is clear that your failure is due to no want of tact on your part. The attack upon you was evidently determined upon the instant you appeared in sight of the village, for men must have been sent out at once to summon the tribe. Your friend Trebon behaved with great intelligence in the matter of your rescue, and I shall at once promote him a step in rank. I am ready to set out again and try whether I can succeed better with some of the other chiefs, if you like, Malchus said. No, Malchus, we will leave them alone for the present. The Romans have been beforehand with us. And as this man was one of their principal chiefs, it is probable that, as he has forsaken his alliance with us, the others have done the same. Moreover, the news of his death, deserved as it was, at the hands of a party of Carthaginians, will not improve their feelings toward us. Nothing short of a general movement among the hill tribes would be of any great advantage to us and it is clear that no general movement can be looked for now. Besides, now that we see the spirit which animates these savages, I do not care to risk your loss by sending you among them. The news of the disaster of Lake Trasimene was met by Rome in a spirit worthy of her. No one so much as breathed the thought of negotiations with the enemy. Not even a soldier was recalled from the army of Spain. Quintus Fabius Maximus was chosen dictator, and he, with two newly raised legions, marched to Ariminum and assumed the command of the army there, raised by the reinforcements he brought with him to 50,000 men. Stringent orders were issued to the inhabitants of the districts through which Hannibal would march on his way to Rome to destroy their crops, drive off their cattle, and take refuge in the fortified towns. Servilius was appointed to the command of the Roman fleet and ordered to oppose the Carthaginians at sea. The army of Fabius was now greatly superior to that of Hannibal, but was inferior in cavalry. He had, moreover, the advantage of being in a friendly country and of being provisioned by the people through whose country he moved, while Hannibal was obliged to scatter his army greatly to obtain provisions. Fabius moved his army until within six miles of that of Hannibal, and then took up his position upon the hills, contenting himself with watching from a distance the movements of the Carthaginians. Hannibal marched unmolested through some of the richest provinces of Italy, till he descended into the plains of Campania. He obtained large quantities of rich booty, but the inhabitants in all cases held aloof from him their belief in the star of Rome being still unshaken in spite of the reverses which had befallen her. Fabius followed at a safe distance, avoiding every attempt of Hannibal to bring on a battle. The Roman soldiers fretted with rage and indignation at seeing the enemy, so inferior in strength to themselves, wasting and plundering the country at their will. Minutius, the master of horse and second in command, a fiery officer, sympathized to the full 
with the anger of the soldiers and continually urged upon fabius to march the army to the assault but fabius was immovable the terrible defeats which hannibal had inflicted upon two roman armies showed him how vast would be the danger of engaging such an opponent unless at some great advantage such advantage he thought he saw when hannibal descended into the plains of campania this plain was enclosed on the south by the river volturnus which could be passed only at the bridge at Casilinum, defended by the roman garrison at that town while on its other sides it was surrounded by an unbroken barrier of steep and wooded hills the passes of which were strongly guarded by the romans after seeing that every road over the hills was strongly held by his troops fabius sat down with his army on the mountains whence he could watch the doings of hannibal's forces on the plains he himself was amply supplied with provisions from the country in his rear and he awaited patiently the time when hannibal having exhausted all the resources of the campania would be forced by starvation to attack the romans in their almost impregnable position in the passes hannibal was perfectly aware of the difficulties of his position had he been free and unencumbered by baggage he might have led his army directly across the wooded mountains avoiding the passes guarded by the romans but with his enormous trail of baggage this was impossible unless he abandoned all the rich plunder which the army had collected of the two outlets from the plain by the appian and latin roads which led to rome neither could be safely attempted for the roman army would have followed in his rear and attacked him while endeavoring to force the passages in the mountains the same objection applied to his crossing the volturnus the only bridge was strongly held by the romans and the river was far too deep and rapid for a passage to be attempted elsewhere with the great roman army close at hand the mountain range between the volturnus and cades was difficult in the extreme as the passes were few and very strongly guarded but it was here that hannibal resolved to make the attempt to lead his army from the difficult position in which it was placed he waited quietly in the plain until the supplies of food were beginning to run low and then prepared for his enterprise an immense number of cattle were among the plunder two thousand of the stoutest of these were selected torches were fastened to their horns and shortly before midnight the light troops drove the oxen to the hills avoiding the position of the passes guarded by the enemy the torches were then lighted and the light troops drove the oxen straight up the hill the animals maddened by fear rushed tumultuously forward scattering in all directions on the hillside but continually urged by the troops behind them mounting towards the summits of the hills the roman defenders of the passes seeing this great number of lights moving upwards supposed that hannibal had abandoned all his baggage and was leading his army straight across the hills this idea was confirmed by the light troops on gaining the crest of the hills commencing an attack upon the romans posted below them in the pass through which hannibal intended to move the roman troops thereupon quitted the pass and scaled the heights to interrupt or harass the retreating foe as soon as hannibal saw the lights moving on the top of the hills he commenced his march the african infantry led the way they were followed by the cavalry then came the baggage and booty and the rear was covered by the spaniards and gauls the defile was found deserted by its defenders and the army marched through unopposed meanwhile fabius with his main army had remained inactive the roman general had seen with astonishment the numerous lights making their way up the mountain side but he feared that this was some device on the part of hannibal to entrap him into an ambush as he had entrapped flaminius on lake trasimene he therefore held his army in readiness for whatever might occur until morning broke then he saw that he had been outwitted the rear of the carthaginian army was just entering the defile and in a short time fabius saw the gauls and spaniards scaling the heights to the assistance of their comrades who were maintaining an unequal fight with the romans 
the latter were soon driven with slaughter into the plain and the carthaginian troops descended into the defile and followed their retreating army hannibal now came down into the fertile country of apulia and determined to winter there he took by storm the town of geronium where he stored his supplies and placed his sick in shelter while his army occupied an entrenched camp which he formed outside the town end of chapter fifteen Chapter 16 of the Young Carthaginian. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Edward Kirkby, Warwick, England. The Young Carthaginian A Story of the Times of Hannibal by George Alfred Henty. Chapter 16 In the Dungeons of Carthage. Fabius after the escape of Hannibal from the trap in which he believed he had caught him, followed him into Apula, and encamped on high ground in his neighbourhood, intending to continue the same waiting tactics. He was, however, soon afterwards recalled to Rome to consult with the Senate on matters connected with the army. He left Minucius in command with strict orders that he should on no account suffer himself to be enticed into a battle. Minucius moved forward to within five miles of Geronium, and then encamped upon a spur of the hills. Hannibal, aware that Fabius had left, hoped to be able to tempt the impatient Minucius to an action. He accordingly drew nearer to the Romans, and encamped upon a hill three miles from their position. Another hill lay about halfway between the two armies. Hannibal occupied this during the night with two thousand of his light troops. But next day Minucius attacked the position, drove off its defenders, and encamped there with his whole army. For some days Hannibal kept his force united in his entrenchments, feeling sure that Minucius would attack him. The latter, however, strictly obeyed the orders of Fabius and remained inactive. It was all important to the Carthaginians to collect an ample supply of food before winter set in, and Hannibal, finding that the Romans would not attack him, was compelled to resume foraging expeditions. Two-thirds of the army were dispatched in various directions in strong bodies while the rest remained to guard the entrenchment. This was the opportunity for which Minucius had been waiting. He at once dispatched the whole of his cavalry to attack the foraging parties, and with his infantry he advanced to the attack of the weakly defended Carthaginian camp. For a time Hannibal had the greatest difficulty in resisting the assault of the Romans, but at last a body of four thousand of the foragers, who had beaten off the Roman cavalry and made their way into Geronium, came out to his support, and the Romans retired. Hannibal, seeing the energy which Minucius had displayed, fell back to his old camp near Geronium, and Minucius at once occupied the position which he had vacated. The partial success of Minucius enabled the party in Rome, who had long been discontented with the waiting tactics of Fabius, to make a fresh attack upon his policy and Minucius was now raised to an equal rank with Fabius. Minucius, elated with his elevation, proposed to Fabius either that they should command the whole army on alternate days, or each should permanently command one half. Fabius chose the latter alternative, for he felt certain that the impetuosity of his colleague would sooner or later get him into trouble with such an adversary as Hannibal, and that it was better to risk the destruction of half the army than of the whole. Minucius withdrew the troops allotted to him, and encamped in the plains at a distance of a mile and a half from Fabius. Hannibal resolved at once to take advantage of the change, and to tempt the Romans to attack him by occupying a hill which lay about halfway between the camp of Minucius and Geronium. The plain which surrounded the hill was level and destitute of wood, but Hannibal, on a careful examination, found there were several hollows in which troops could be concealed and in these, during the night, he posted 5,000 infantry and 500 cavalry. The position occupied by them was such that they would be able to take the Romans in flank and rear should they advance against the hill. Having made these dispositions, he sent forward a body of light troops in the morning to occupy the hill. Minucius immediately dispatched his light troops, supported by cavalry, to drive them from it. Hannibal reinforced his Carthaginians by small bodies of troops, 
and the fight was obstinately maintained until Minucius, whose blood was now up, marched towards the hill with his legions in order of battle. Hannibal on his side advanced with the remains of his troops, and the battle became fierce and general, until Hannibal gave the signal to his troops in ambush, who rushed out and charged the Romans in rear and flank. The destruction would have been as complete and terrible as that which had befallen the army of Sempronius at the Trabea, had not Fabius moved forward with his troops to save the broken legions of Minucius. Fabius now offered battle, but Hannibal, well content with the heavy blow which he had struck, and the great loss which he had inflicted upon the command of Minucius, fell back to his camp. Minucius acknowledged that Fabius had saved his army from total destruction, and at once resigned his command into his hands, and reverted to his former position under him. Both armies then went into winter quarters. Malchus had not been present at the fighting near Geronium. Two days after Hannibal broke through the Roman position round the plains of Campania, he entrusted Malchus with an important commission. Commanding the bodyguard of the general, and being closely related to him, Malchus was greatly in Hannibal's confidence, and was indeed on the same footing with Mago, Hannibal's brother, and two or three other of his most trusted generals. Gathered in the general's tent on the previous evening, these had agreed with their leader that final success could not be looked for in their enterprise unless reinforcements were received from Carthage. It was now a year since they had emerged from the Alps, on to the plains of northern Italy. They had annihilated two Roman armies, had marched almost unopposed through some of the richest provinces of Italy, and yet they were no nearer the great object of their enterprise than they were when they crossed the Alps. Some of the Cisalpine Gauls had joined them, but even in the plains north of the Apennines, the majority of the tribes had remained firm to their alliance with the Romans, while south of that range of mountains the inhabitants had in every case shown themselves busily hostile. Everywhere on the approach of the Carthaginians they had retired to their walled towns, which Hannibal had neither the time nor the necessary machines to besiege. Although Rome had lost two armies, she had already equipped and placed in the field a third force, superior in number to that of the Carthaginians. Her army in Spain had not been drawn upon. Her legion north of the Apennines was operating against the revolted tribes. Other legions were in course of being raised and equipped, and Rome would take the field in the spring with an army greatly superior in strength to that of Carthage. Victorious as Hannibal had been in battle, the army which had struggled through the Alps had, in the year which had elapsed, greatly diminished in numbers. Trebia and Tresemene had both lessened their strength, but their losses had been much heavier in the terrible march across the Apennines in the spring, and by fevers subsequently contracted from the pestiferous malaria of the marshes in the summer. In point of numbers, the gaps had been filled up by the contingents furnished by their Gaulish allies. But the loss of all the elephants, of a great number of the cavalry, and of the Carthaginian troops who formed the backbone of the army, was not to be replaced. Malchus, Hannibal said, You know what we were speaking of yesterday evening. It is absolutely necessary that we should receive reinforcements. If Carthage aids me, I regard victory as certain. Two or three campaigns like the last would alike break down the strength of Rome and will detach her allies from her. The Latins and the other Italian tribes, when they find that Rome is powerless to protect them, that their flocks and herds, their crops and possessions are at our mercy, will at length become weary of supporting her cause, and will cast in their lot with us. But if the strife is to be continued, Carthage must make an effort, must rouse herself from the lethargy in which she appears to be sunk. It is impossible for me to leave the army, nor can I well spare Margo. The cavalry are devoted to him, and losing him would be like losing my right hand. Yet it is clear that someone must go to Carthage who can speak in my name, and can represent the true situation here. Will you undertake the mission? It is one of great danger. In the first place you will have to make your way by sea to Greece, and thence take ship to Carthage. When you arrive there, you will be bitterly opposed by Hanno and his faction, who are now all-powerful, and it may be that your mission may cost you your life. For not only do these men hate me, and all connected with me, 
but like most demagogues they place their own selfish aids and ends the advantage of their own fraction and the furtherance of their own schemes far above the general welfare of the state the loss of all the colonies of carthage and the destruction of her imperial power the loss of national prestige and honour are to these men as nothing in comparison with the question whether they can retain their places and emoluments as rulers of carthage rome is divided as we are her patricians and plebeians are ever bitterly opposed to each other but at present patriotism rises above party and both sink their disputes when the national cause is at stake the time will doubtless come that is unless we cut her course short as rome increases in wealth and in luxury she will suffer from the like evils that are destroying carthage party exigencies will rise above patriotic considerations and rome will fall to pieces unless she finds some man strong and vigorous enough to grasp the whole power of the state to silence the chattering of the politicians and to rule her with a rod of iron but i am wandering from my subject will you undertake this mission i will malchus replied firmly if you think me worthy of it i have no eloquence as a speaker and i know nothing of the arts of the politician there will be plenty of our friends there who will be able to harangue the multitude hannibal replied it is your presence there as the representative of the army as my kinsman and as the son of the general who did such good service to the state that will profit our cause it is your mission to tell carthage that now is her time or never that rome already totters from the blows i have struck her and that another blow only is requisite to stretch her in the dust a mighty effort is needed to overthrow once for all our great rival sacrifices will be needed and great ones to obtain the object but rome once fallen the future of carthage is secure what is needed is that carthage should obtain and keep the command of the sea for two years that at least twenty five thousand men should be sent over in the spring and as many in the spring following with such reinforcements i will undertake to destroy absolutely the power of rome to-morrow i will furnish you with letters to our friends at home giving full details as to the course they should pursue and particulars of our needs a party of horse shall accompany you to the coast with a score of men used to navigation there you will seize a ship and sail for corinth whence you will have no difficulty in obtaining passage to carthage after nightfall the next day malchus started taking nisus with him as his attendant and companion the party travelled all night and in the morning the long line of the sea was visible from the summits of the hills they were crossing they waited for some hours to rest and refresh their horses and then continuing their journey came down in the afternoon upon a little port at the mouth of the river Bifernon. so unexpected was their approach that the inhabitants had no time to shut their gates and the troops entered the town without resistance the people all flying to their houses malchus at once proclaimed that the carthaginians came as friends and would if unmolested injure no one but if any armed attempt was made against them they would sack and destroy the town two or three vessels were lying in the port malchus took possession of the largest and putting his party of seamen on board her ordered the crew to sail for corinth the horsemen were to remain in the town until the vessel returned when with the party on board her they would at once rejoin hannibal the wind was favorable and the next morning the mountains of greece were in sight and in the afternoon they entered the port of corinth the anchor was dropped at a short distance from the shore the small boat was lowered and malchus accompanied by nisus was rowed ashore by two of his own men these then returned on board the ship which at once weighed anchor and set sail on her return corinth was a large and busy port and the arrival and departure of the little vessel from italy passed altogether unnoticed and without attracting any particular attention malchus and his companion made their way along the wharves the trade of corinth was large and flourishing and the scene reminded malchus of that with which he was so familiar in carthage ships of many nationalities were ranged along the quays galleys from tyre and cyprus from syria and egypt from carthage and italy were all assembled in this neutral port corinth was like carthage essentially a trading community 
and while the power and glory of the rival cities of the Peloponnesus were rapidly failing, Corinth was rising in rank, and was now the first city of Greece. Malchus had no difficulty in finding a Carthaginian trading ship. He was amply supplied with money, and soon struck a bargain that the captain should, without waiting to take on further cargo, at once sail for Carthage. The captain was much surprised at the appearance in Corinth of a young Carthaginian evidently of high rank, but he was too well satisfied at the bargain he had made to ask any questions. An hour later the mooring ropes were cast off, and the vessel, spreading her sails, started on her voyage. The weather was warm and pleasant, and Malchus, stretched on a couch spread on the poop, greatly enjoyed the rest and quiet, after the long months which had been spent in almost incessant activity. Upon the following day Nisus approached him. "'My lord Malchus,' he said, "'there are some on board the ship who know you. I have overheard the men talking together, and it seemed that one of them recognized you as having been in the habit of going out with a fisherman who lived next door to him at Carthage. "'It matters not,' Malchus said indifferently. "'I have no particular motive in concealing my name, though it would have been as well that I should be able to meet my friends in Carthage, and consult with them before my arrival there was generally known. However, before I leave the ship I can distribute some money among the crew, and tell them that for certain reasons of state I do not wish them to mention on shore that I have been a passenger. Had Malchus been aware that the ship in which he had taken passage was one of the great fleet of traders owned by Hanno, he would have regarded the discovery of his personality by the sailors in a more serious light. As it was, he thought no more of the matter. No change in the manner of the captain showed that he was aware of the name and rank of his passenger, and Malchus, as he watched the wide expanse of sea, broken only by a few distant sails, was too intent upon the mission with which he was charged to give the matter another moment's thought. The wind fell light and it was not until the evening of the eighth day after leaving Corinth that Carthage, with the citadel of Bursa rising above it, could be distinguished. The ship was moving but slowly through the water, and the captain said that unless a change took place they would not make port until late the next morning. Malchus retired to his couch feeling sorry that the period of rest and tranquillity was at an end, and that he was now about to embark in a difficult struggle which, though he felt its importance, was altogether alien to his taste and disposition. He had not even the satisfaction that he should see his mother and sister, for news had come a short time before he sailed that their position was so uncomfortable at Carthage that they had left for Spain, to take up their abode there with Adurbal and Anna. His mother was, he heard, completely broken down in health by grief for the loss of his father. He was wakened in the night by the splash of the anchor and the running out of the cable through the horse hole, and supposed that the breeze must have sprung up a little, and that they had anchored at the entrance to the harbour. He soon went off to sleep again, but was presently aroused by what seemed to him the sound of a short struggle followed by another splash. He dreamingly wondered what it could be, and then went off to sleep again. When he awoke it was daylight. Somewhat surprised at the non-appearance of Nisus, who usually came into his cabin the first thing in the morning to call him, he soon attired himself. On going to the door of his cabin he was surprised to find it fastened without. He knocked loudly against it to attract attention, but almost immediately found himself in darkness. Going to the porthole to discover the cause of this sudden change, he found that a sack had been stuffed into it, and immediately afterwards the sound of hammering told him that a plank was being nailed over this outside to keep it in place. The truth washed across him. He was a prisoner. Drawing his sword, he flung himself with all his force against the door, but this had been so securely fastened without that it did not yield in the slightest to his efforts. After several vain efforts, he abandoned the attempt, and sitting down, endeavoured to realise the position. He soon arrived at something like the truth. The trading interests of Carthage were wholly at the disposal of Hanno and his party, and he doubted not that, having been recognised, the captain had determined to detain him as a prisoner until he communicated to Hanno the fact of his arrival, and received instructions from him as to whether Malchus was to be allowed to land. Malchus recalled the sounds he had heard in the night, 
and uttered an exclamation of grief and anger as he concluded that his faithful follower had been attacked and doubtless killed and thrown overboard. At present he was powerless to do anything, and with his sword grasped in his hand he lay on the couch in readiness to start up and fight his way out as soon as he heard those without undoing the fastenings of the door. The day passed slowly. He could hear voices without and footsteps on the deck of the poop overhead, but no one came near him and after a time his watchfulness relaxed, as he made up his mind that his captors, whatever their intentions might be, would not attempt to carry them out until after nightfall. At last he heard a moving of the heavy articles which had been piled against the door. He sprang to his feet, the door opened two or three inches, and a voice said, In the name of the Republic, I declare you to be my prisoner. I warn you I shall resist, Malchus exclaimed. I am Malchus, the son of Hamilcar, late a general of the Republic, and I come to Carthage on the mission from Hannibal. Whatever complaint the state may have against me, I am ready to answer the proper time, and shall not fail to appear when called upon. But at present I have Hannibal's mission to discharge, and those who interfere with me are traitors to the Republic, whomsoever they may be, and I will defend myself until the last. Open the door and seize him a voice exclaimed. As the door was opened, Malchus sprang forward, but the lights of several lanterns showed a dozen men with levelled spears standing in front of the cabin. I surrender, he said, seeing that against such a force as this resistance would be vain. But in the name of Hannibal, I protest against this interference with a messenger whom he has sent to explain in his name to the Senate the situation in Italy. So saying, Malchus laid down his shield and sword, took off his helmet, and walked quietly from the cabin. At an order from their superior, four of the men laid down their weapons and seized him. In a minute he was bound hand and foot, a gag was forced into his mouth, a cloak thrown over his head, and he was roughly thrown into a large boat alongside the ship. Short as was the time which he had at liberty, Malchus had thrown a glance over the bulwarks of each side of the ship and perceived that any resistance would have been useless, for far away lay the lights of Carthage, and it was evident that the vessel had made little progress since he had retired to rest on the previous evening. Had she been inside the harbour, he had intended to spring overboard at once, and to trust to escape by swimming. The person in command of the party which had seized Malchus took his place at the helm of the boat, and his twelve agents seated themselves at the oars and rowed away towards Carthage. The town was nearly eight miles away, and they were two hours before they arrived there. The place where they landed was at some distance from the busy part of the port. Two men were waiting for them there with a stretcher. Upon this Malchus was laid. Four men lifted it on their shoulders, the others fell in around it as guard, and the party then proceeded through quiet streets towards the citadel. The hour was late, and but few people were about. Any who paused for a moment to look at the little procession shrank away hastily on hearing the dreaded words, in the name of the Republic, uttered by the leader of the party. The citizens of Carthage were too well accustomed to midnight arrest to give the matter further thought, save a momentary wonder as to who was the last victim of the tyrants of the city, and to indulge, perhaps, in a secret malediction upon them. Malchus had from the first no doubt as to his destination, when he felt a sudden change in the angle at which the stretcher was carried, knew that he was being taken up to the steep ascent to Bursa. He heard presently the challenge of a sentry, then there was a pause as the gates were opened, then he was carried forward for a while, there was another stop, and the litter was lowered to the ground. His cords were unfastened, and he was commanded to rise. It needed but a glance upwards to tell him where he was. Above him towered the dark mass of the Temple of Moloch. Facing him was a small door known to every citizen of Carthage as leading to the dungeons under the temple. Brave as he was, Malchus could not resist a shudder as he entered the portal, accompanied by four of his guards and preceded by a jailer. No questions were asked by the latter, and doubtless the coming of the prisoner had been expected and prepared for. The way lay down a long flight of steps and through several passages, all hewn in solid rock. They passed many closed doors, until at last they turned into one which stood open. 
The gag was then removed from Alicus's mouth. The door was closed behind him. He heard the bolts fastened, and then remained alone in perfect darkness. Malchus felt around the walls of his cell, and found that it was about six feet square. In one corner was a bundle of straw, and spreading this out he threw himself upon it, and bitterly meditated over the position into which he had fallen. His own situation was desperate enough. He was helpless in the hands of Hanno. The friends and partisans of Hannibal were ignorant of his coming, and he could hope for no help from them. He had little doubt as to what his fate would be. He would be put to death in some cruel way, and Hannibal, his relatives and friends, would never know what had come of him from the moment when he left the Italian vessel in the port of Corinth. But hopeless as was his own situation, Malchus thought more of Hannibal and his brave companions in arms than of himself. The manner in which he had been kidnapped by the agents of Hanno showed how determined was that demagogue to prevent the true state of things which prevailed in Italy from becoming known to the people of Carthage. In order to secure their own triumph, he and his party were willing to sacrifice Hannibal and his army, and to involve Carthage in the most terrible disasters. At last Malchus slept. When he awoke, a faint light was streaming down into his cell. In the centre of the room was an opening of about a foot square, above which a sort of chimney extended twenty feet up through the solid rock to the surface, where it was covered with an iron grating. Malchus knew where he was. Along each side of the great temple extended a row of these gratings level with the floor and every citizen knew that it was through these apertures that light and air reached the prisoners in the cells below. Sometimes groans and cries were heard to rise, but those who were near would hurry from the spot, for they knew that the spies of the law were ever on the watch, and that to be suspected of entering into communication with the prisoners would be sufficient to ensure condemnation and death. It was the sight of these gratings, and the thought of the dismal cells below, which had increased the aversion which Malchus had felt as a boy to enter the blood-stained temple. Little as he had dreamed that the day would come when he himself would be lying a prisoner in one of them. He knew that it was useless for him to attempt by shouting to inform his friends in the city of his presence there. The narrowness of the air passage and the closeness of the grating above deadened and confused the voice. Unless to a person standing immediately above the opening, and, as the visitors to the temple carefully avoided the vicinity of the gratings, it would be but a waste of breath to attempt to call their attention. As to escape, it was out of the question. The cell was cut in the solid rock. The door was of enormous strength, and even could that have been overcome, there were many others which would have to be passed before he could arrive at the entrance to the dungeon. In a short time a Numidian entered, bearing some bread and a pitcher of water. Malchus addressed him, but the negro opened his mouth, and Malchus saw that his tongue had been cut out, perhaps in childhood, perhaps as a punishment for a crime, but more probably the man was a slave captured in war, who had been mutilated to render him a safe and useful instrument of the officers of the law. Three hours later the door opened again, and two men appeared. They ordered Malchus to follow them, and led him through a number of meandering passages, until at last, opening a door, they ushered him into a large chamber. This was lighted by torches. At a table in the centre of the room were seated seven figures. In the one seated in a chair very slightly above the others, Malchus at once recognised Hanno. His companions were all leading men of his faction. Malchus, son of Hamilcar, Hanno said, what have you to say why you thus secretly come to Carthage? I come not secretly, Malchus replied. I come hither as the messenger of Hannibal to the Senate. I am charged by him to lay before them the exact situation in Italy, to tell them how much he has already accomplished, and what yet remains to be done, and to explain to them the need there is that reinforcements should be dispatched to him to carry out his great designs for the annihilation of the power of Rome. I come not in secret, I passed in a ship from Italy to Corinth, and there at once hired a vessel to convey me hither. As we are members of the state, Hannah said, you can deliver your message to us. I fear that it will go no further, Malchus replied. 
the fact that i have been thus secretly seized and carried here shows how far it is your wish that the people of carthage should know my message still as even in your breasts all patriotism may not yet be dead and as my words may move you yet to do something to enable hannibal to save the republic i will give you the message he sent me to deliver to the senate a murmur of angry surprise arose from the seven men at the bold words and the defiant bearing of their prisoner how dare you thus address your judges hanno exclaimed judges malchus repeated scornfully executioners you should say think you that i know not that my death is resolved on even if you would dare not free a noble of carthage a son of a general who has lost his life in her service a cousin of the great hannibal after you have thus treacherously seized and thrown him into a dungeon cowed as the people of carthage are by your tyranny corrupted as they are by your gold this lawless act of oppression would arouse them to resistance no hanno it is because i know that my doom is sealed i thus fearlessly defy you and your creatures malchus then proceeded to deliver the message of hannibal to the senate he showed the exact situation of affairs in italy urged that if the reinforcements asked for were sent the success of the arms of carthage and the final defeat and humiliation of rome were assured while on the other hand if hannibal were left unaided his army must in time dwindle away until too feeble to resist the assaults of the romans and their allies he warned his hearers that if this catastrophe should come about rome flushed with victory smarting under the defeats and humiliation which hannibal had inflicted upon them would in turn become the aggressor and would inflict upon carthage a blow similar to that with which rome had been menaced by hannibal hanno and his companions listened in silence malchus for a time forgot his own position and the character of the men he addressed and pleaded with an earnestness and passion such as he would have used had he been addressing the whole senate when he had finished hanno without a word motioned to the jailers and these placing themselves one on each side of malchus led him back to his cell end of chapter 16 recording by edward kirkby warwick england Chapter Seventeen of the Young Carthaginian. This is the LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Edward Kirkby, Warwick, England. The Young Carthaginian, a story of the times of Hannibal by George Alfred Henty. Chapter Seventeen: The Escape. For the next two days Malchus was visited only by the Numidian, who brought his food. The third night, as he was lying on his straw, wondering how long Hanno would be before he decided his fate, he started to his feet as he heard apparently close at hand his name whispered. It was repeated, and he now perceived that it came from above. Yes, he said in a low tone, looking upwards. I am Malchus. Who speaks to me? It is I, Nisus. The voice replied thanks to the gods i have found my lord how did you get here nisus i feared that you were drowned i swam to shore the arab said and then watched outside the gate here i saw several prisoners brought in and doubted not that you were among them i was at the port when the ship came in and i found that she brought no passenger then i came up here again soon found friends among the arab regiment in the garrison these obtained me employment in the stables of the elephants each night when all has been still i have crept here and have whispered your name down each of the gratings tonight you have heard me now that i know where you are i will set to work to contrive your escape is the passage from your cell here wide enough to admit your being drawn up yes malchus replied it would be a close fit but with a rope you could get me up through it i will set to work to loosen these bars at once nisus said but the difficulty is not to get you out from here but to get you beyond the gates of the citadel 
the watch is extremely strict and the gates are not opened until nine o'clock before that your escape would be discovered and it would be impossible for you to pass out undetected i must find a hiding place where you can lie concealed until the search is over and the vigilance of the sentries is relaxed but it will be no easy matter and now let us speak no more it is dangerous to breathe much less to speak here not another word was spoken for hours malchus could hear a low continuous scraping noise as nisus with his dagger worked away upon the stone into which the grating fitted at last nisus spoke again i have nearly finished my lord the greater part of the grating is loose and in half an hour i can complete the work daylight will soon be breaking and i must go tomorrow night i will return with a rope i hope today to find some place where you may be concealed malchus with renewed hope threw himself upon the straw and lay there until about noon when he was again summoned to the presence of his judges they were the same whom he had seen previously malchus son of hamilcar hanno said you are now brought before us to hear the crime with which you are charged we have here before us the written list of the names of the members of the conspiracy headed by giscon which had for its aim the murder of many of the senate of carthage and the overthrow of her constitution we have also here the confession of several of the conspirators confirming this list and saying that you were one of the party i do not deny malchus said firmly that i did once visit the place in which those you speak of met and that my name was then entered on the roll but when i went there i was wholly ignorant of the purposes of the association and as soon as i learned their aims and objects i withdrew from them and did not again visit their place of meeting you could not well do that hanno said since it is writ down that you sailed very shortly afterwards for spain i own that i did so malchus replied but i told giscon on the very day that i accompanied him to the meeting that i would go there no more moreover your commissioners with hannibal's army have already inquired into the circumstances and they in consideration of the fact that i was then little more than sixteen years old that i was led ignorantly into the plot and at once separated myself from it absolved me from blame the commissioners had no authority to do so hanno replied they were ordered to send you to carthage and failed to carry out their orders only because hannibal then as always set himself above the authority of the republic as you have confessed that you were a member of this conspiracy no further trial is needed and this court awards you the same punishment which was meted to all the others concerned in this conspiracy you will tomorrow be put to death by the usual punishment of the press malchus abstained from all reply for it struck him at once that were he to defy and anger his judges they might order him to be instantly executed he therefore without a word turned and accompanied his jailer to his cell he waited impatiently for night and the hours seemed long indeed before he heard the whisper of nisus above directly the arab received the reply assuring him that malchus was still there he again set to work in an hour the grating was removed and the rope lowered malchus fastened it under his arms knotting it in front and then whispered to nisus that he was ready the arab drew him slowly and steadily up until his head was in the entrance of the narrow passage malchus had grasped the rope as high as possible above his head and hung by his hands thereby drawing his shoulders upwards and reducing their width as much as possible he then managed to swing himself so that his body was diagonally across the opening and when thus placed he found to his joy that the passage was large enough for him to pass through without much difficulty slowly and steadily nisus drew him up until his shoulders were above the level of the ground when malchus placing his hands on the pavement sprang noiselessly out the grating was replaced and without a word being spoken they glided from the temple not a word was said until they had gone some little distance you have saved my life again nisus malchus said laying his hand upon his shoulder another twelve hours and it would have been too late i was to have been put to death in the morning 
Nisus gave a fierce exclamation and placed his hand on his knife. Had they slain my lord, he said, I would have avenged you. I would have dogged your enemies night and day till one by one my knife should have found its way to their hearts. Have you found a hiding place, Nisus? There is but one place of safety, my lord, that I can think of. I have talked it over with two or three faithful friends, and they agree that so rigid will be the search that it would be well nigh impossible for any one within the walls of the citadel to escape detection. The spies of Hanno are everywhere, and men fear within these walls even to whisper what they think. At any rate, no more secure hiding place could be found than that which we have decided upon. And where is that, Nisus? It is in the reservoirs with four water skins and some planks we have prepared a raft. My two friends are waiting for us at one of the entrances. They will have fitted the raft together, and all will be in readiness. They are not likely to search for you there. The idea is excellent, Nisus. The reservoirs of Carthage were of enormous extent, and some of these remain to this day, and are the wonder and admiration of travellers. They were subterranean and were cut from solid rock, the stone extracted from them being used for the walls of the buildings of the city. Pillars were left at intervals to support the roof, and it was calculated that these underground lakes, for they were no less, contained sufficient water to supply the wants of the great city for at least six months. These vast storing places for water were an absolute necessity in a climate like that of northern Africa, where the rain falls but seldom. Without them, indeed, Carthage would have been at the mercy of the first army which laid siege to it. The greatest pains were devoted to the maintenance of the water supply. The rainfall from the roofs of the temples and houses was conducted to the reservoirs, and these stores were never drawn upon on ordinary occasions, the town being supplied with water brought by aqueducts from long distances among the hills. Here and there openings were cut in the rock, which formed the roof of the reservoirs for the admission of air, and at a few points steps from the surface led down to the water. Iron gates guarded the entrance to these. Nisus and his friends had the evening before unfastened one of the gates. The lock was old and little used, as the gate was placed rather to prevent children and others going down to the water than for any other purpose, and the Arabs had found little difficulty in picking the rough lock. Malchus followed Nisus down the steps until he reached the edge of the water, some fifty feet below the surface. Here stood two Arabs bearing torches. At the foot of the steps floated the raft, formed, as Nisus had said, of four inflated sheepskins connected by a framework of planks. Across these a bullock's hide had been stretched, forming a platform. On this were some rugs, a skin of wine, and a pile of flat cakes and fruit, together with half a dozen torches. Thanks, my friends, Malchus said to the Arabs. Some day I may be able to prove that I am grateful to you. The friends of Nisus are our friends, one of the Arabs replied simply. His lord is our master. Here is a paddle, my lord, Nisus said. I propose that you should paddle straight away as far as you can see a torch burning here, then that you should fasten the raft to a pillar. Every other night I will come with provisions here and show a light. If you see the light burn steadily, it is safe for you to approach, and I come only to bring food or news. If you see the torch wave to and fro, it is a warning that they intend to search the reservoirs. I do not think it likely they will do so. Still, it is best to be prepared, and in that case you must paddle far away in the recesses. They might search for a long time before they find you, I trust that your imprisonment here will not be long, but that we may hit upon some plan of getting you out of the citadel. I would gladly go with you to share your solitude, but I must remain outside to plan some way of escape. With a short farewell to his faithful follower, Malchus took his place on the raft, having lit a torch and fastened it upright upon it. Then he paddled slowly away, keeping between the lines of heavy columns. His rate of progress was slow, and for half an hour he kept the torch in sight. By this time he felt sure that he must be approaching the boundary of the reservoir. He therefore moored his raft against a pillar and waved his torch backwards and forwards. 
The signal was answered by a similar movement of the distant light, which then disappeared. Malchus now extinguished his own torch, placed the means of relighting it with which Nisus had furnished him close to his hand, and then wrapping himself in a rug, lay down to sleep. When he awoke it was day, the light was streaming down onto the water from an opening two or three hundred yards away, while far in the distance he could see a faint light which marked the place of the steps at which he had embarked. In the neighbourhood of the opening the column stood up clear and grey against the dark background. A little further off their outlines were dim and misty, and wherever else he looked an inky darkness met his eye, save one or two faint bands of misty light which marked the position of distant openings. The stillness which reigned in this vast cavern was almost oppressive. Sometimes a faint rustling whisper, the echo of some sound in the citadel above, passed among the columns, and the plaintive squeak of a bat was heard now and then, for numbers of these creatures were flitting noiselessly in the darkness, their forms visible for an instant as they passed and repassed between Malchus and the light. He wondered vaguely what they could find to eat here, and then remembered that he had heard that at nightfall numbers of bats could be seen flying up from the openings to the reservoirs to seek food without, returning to the hiding places when morning approached. Malchus amused himself by thinking over the fury and astonishment of Hanno and his colleagues on hearing that their prisoner had disappeared, and he pictured to himself the hot search which was no doubt going on throughout the citadel. He thought it improbable in the extreme that any search would be made in the reservoir. Nisus would refasten the gate after passing through it again, and the idea that he could be floating on the subterranean lake could hardly occur to them. Then he turned over in his mind the various devices by which it might be possible to get beyond the walls of the citadel, the anxiety of Hanno and those acting with him to prevent the manner in which they had kidnapped and sentenced to death the messenger and kinsman of Hannibal from becoming known in the city would be so great that extraordinary vigilance would be used to prevent any from leaving the citadel. The guards on the walls would be greatly increased, none would be allowed to pass the gate without the most rigorous examination while every nook and corner of the citadel, the temples, the barracks, storehouses, and stables would be searched again and again. Even should a search be made in the reservoir, Malchus had little fear of discovery. Even should a boat come towards the spot where he was lying, he would only have to pass the raft round to the opposite side of the great pillar, some twelve feet square, against which he was lying. When the light faded out, he again lay down to sleep. As before, he slept soundly, for, however great the heat above, the air in the subterranean chambers was always fresh and cool, and he could well bear the rugs which Nisus had provided. The next day passed more slowly, for he had less to think about. After the daylight had again faded, he began to look forward expectantly for the signal, although he knew what many hours must still elapse before Nisus would be able to make his way to the place of meeting. So slowly did the hours pass, indeed, that he began at last to fear that something must have happened, perhaps that Nisus had been in some way recognized, and was now in the dungeons below the temple of Moloch. At last, however, to his joy, Malchus saw the distant light. It burned steadily, and he at once set out to paddle towards it. He did not light his torch. It would have taken time, and he knew that, Quietly as he paddled, the sound would be borne along the surface of the water to Nisus. At last he arrived at the steps. Nisus was there alone. Beside him was a basket of fresh provisions. Well, Nisus, what news? All is well, my lord, but Hanno is moving heaven and earth to find you. The gates of the citadel were kept closed all day yesterday, and although today they have again been opened, the examination of those who pass out is so strict that no disguise would avail to deceive the scrutiny of the searchers. One or other of the men who attended you in the prison is always at the gate. The barracks have been searched from end to end, the troops occupying them being all turned out, while the agents of the law searched them from top to bottom. The same has been done with the stables, and it is well that we did not attempt to hide you above ground, for assuredly, if we had done so, they would have found you, however cunningly we had stowed you away. 
of course the name of the prisoner who has escaped is known to none but to the report that an important prisoner had escaped from the state prisons beneath the temple has created quite an excitement in the city for it is said that such an event never took place before at present i can hit on no plan whatever for getting you free then i must contend to wait for a while nisus after a time their vigilance is sure to relax as they will think that i must have got beyond the walls are there any to whom you would wish me to bear news that you are here this was a question that malchus had debated with himself over and over again it appeared to him however that hanno's power was so great that it would be dangerous for any one to come forward and accuse him no doubt every one of the leading men of the barcine party was strictly watched and did hanno suspect that any of them were in communication with the escaped prisoner he would take instant steps against them he thought it better therefore that none should be acquainted with the secret until he was free he therefore replied in the negative to the question of nisus i must wait till i am free any action now might bring down the vengeance of hanno upon others he would find no difficulty in inventing some excuse for dealing a blow at them you think there is no possibility of escape at present i can think of no plan my lord so strict is the search that when the elephants went down to-day to the fountains for water every howder was examined to see that no one was hidden within it it will be necessary also nisus if you do hit upon some plan for getting me out to arrange a hiding-place in the city that will be easy enough nisus replied my friends have many relations in the arab quarter and once free you might be concealed there for any time and now i will wait no longer for last night visits were made in all the barracks and stables by the agents of the law to see that every man was asleep in his place therefore i will return without delay in two days i will be here again but should anything occur which it is needful to tell you i will be here to-morrow night malchus watched for the light on the following evening but with faint hope of seeing it but at about the same hour as before he saw it suddenly appear again wondering what had brought nisus before his time he paddled to the stairs well nisus what is your news we have hit upon a plan of escape my lord as i told you my friend and i are in the stable with the elephants our duties being to carry in the forage for the great beasts and to keep the stables in order we have taken one of the indian mahouts into our confidence and he has promised his aid the elephant of which he is in charge is a docile beast and his driver has taught him many tricks at his signal he will put up his trunk and scream and rush here and there as if in the state which is called must when they are dangerous of approach the mahout who is a crafty fellow taught him to act thus because when in such a state of temper the elephants cannot be worked with the others but remain in the stables and their drivers have an easy time of it on the promise of a handsome reward the mahout has agreed that tomorrow morning before the elephants are taken out you shall be concealed in the bottom of the howdah he will manage that the elephant is the first in the procession when we get out into the courtyard he will slyly prick the beast and give him the signal to simulate rage he will then so direct him that after charging several times about the court he shall make a rush at the gate you may be sure that the guards there will step aside quickly enough for a furious elephant is not a creature to be hindered when he is once down to the foot of the hill the driver will direct him to some quiet spot that he will find easily enough for at his approach there will be a general stampede when he reaches some place where no one is in sight he will halt the elephant and you will at once drop off him i shall be near at hand and will join you the elephant will continue his course for some little distance and the mahout feigning to have at last recovered control of him will direct him back to the citadel the idea is a capital one malchus said and if carried out will surely succeed you and i have often seen during our campaigns elephants in this state and know how every one flees as they come along screaming loudly with their trunks high and their great ears out on each side of their heads at any rate it is worth trying nisus and if by any chance we should fail in getting through the gate the mahout would of course take his elephant back to the stable and i might slip out there and conceal myself till night and then make my way back here again that's what we have arranged nisus said 
and now my lord i will leave you and go back to the stables in case they should search them again tonight if you will push off and lie a short distance away from the steps i will be here again half an hour before daybreak i will bring you a garb like my own and will take you direct to the stable where the animal is kept there will be no one there save the mahout and my two friends so that it will be easy for us to cover you in the howdah before the elephants go out there is little chance of anyone coming into the stables before that for they have been searched so frequently during the last two days that hanno's agents must by this time be convinced that wherever you are hidden you are not there indeed today the search has greatly relaxed although the vigilance at the gate and on the walls is as great as ever so i think that they despair of finding you and believe that you must either have made your escape already or that if not you will sooner or later issue from your hiding place and fall into their hands malchus slept little that night and rejoiced when he again saw nisus descending the steps a few strokes of his paddle sent the raft alongside nisus fastened a cord to it to prevent it from drifting away we may need it again he said briefly malchus placed his own clothes upon it and threw over his shoulders the burnous which nisus had brought he then mounted the steps with him the gate was closed and the bolt shot and they then made their way across to the stables it was still perfectly dark though a very faint light low in the eastern sky showed that ere long the day would break five minutes walking and they arrived at the stables of the elephants these like those of the horses and the oxen which drew the cumbrous war machines were formed in the vast thickness of the walls and were what are known in modern times as casemates as nisus had said the indian mahout and the other two arabs were the only human occupants of the casement the elephant at once showed that he perceived the newcomer to be a stranger by an uneasy movement but the mahout quieted him while they were waiting for the morning nisus described more fully than he had hitherto had an opportunity of doing the attack upon him on board the ship i was he said as my lord knows uneasy when i found that they had recognized you and when we were within a day's sail of carthage i resolved to keep a lookout therefore although i wrapped myself in my cloak and lay down i did not go to sleep after a while i thought i heard the sound of oars and standing up went to the bulwark to listen suddenly some of the sailors who must have been watching me sprang upon me from behind a cloak was thrown over my head a rope was twisted around my arms and in a moment i was lifted and flung overboard i did not cry out because i had already made my mind that it was better not to arouse you from sleep whatever happened as had you run out you might have been killed and i thought it likely that their object would be if you offered no resistance to take you a prisoner in which case i trusted that i might later on hope to free you as my lord knows i am a good swimmer i let myself sink and when well below the surface soon got rid of the rope which bound me and which was indeed but hastily twisted around my arms i came up to the surface as noiselessly as possible and after taking a long breath dived and swam under water for as far as i could when i came up the ship was so far away that there was little fear of their seeing me however i dived again and again until in perfect safety I heard a boat rowed by many oars approach the vessel i listened for a time and found that all was quiet and then laid myself out for a long swim to shore which i reached without difficulty all day i kept my eye on the vessel which remained at anchor as i could not tell which landing place you might be brought i went up in the evening and took my post on the road leading up here and when towards the morning a party entered carrying one with them on a stretcher i had little doubt that it was you i was sure to find friends among the arabs either belonging to the regiment stationed at bursa or those employed in the storehouse or stables so the next morning i entered the citadel and soon met these men who belonged to my tribe and village after that my way was plain my only fear was that they might kill you before i could discover the place in which you were confined my heart sank the first night when i found that although i whispered down every one of the gratings i could obtain no reply i had many answers indeed but not from you 
there might be many cells beside those with openings into the temple and were you placed in one of those i might never hear of you again i had resolved that if the next night passed without my being able to find you i would inform some of those known to be friends of hannibal that you were a prisoner and leave it in their hands to act as they liked while i still continued my efforts to communicate with you you may imagine with what joy i heard your reply on the following night i must have been asleep the first night malchus said and did not hear your voice i feared to speak above a whisper my lord there are priests all night in the sanctuary behind the great image day had by this time broken and a stir and bustle commenced in front of the long line of casements the elephants were brought out from their stables and stood rocking themselves from side to side while their keepers rubbed their hides with pumice stone nisus was one of those who was appointed to make the great flat cakes of coarse flour which formed the principal food of the elephants the other arabs busied themselves in bringing in fresh straw which malchus scattered evenly over the stall heaps of freshly cut forage were placed before each elephant in a short time one of the arabs took the place of nisus in preparing the cakes while nisus moved away and presently went down into the town to await the coming of malchus by this arrangement if the superintendent of the stables came round he would find the proper number of men at work and was not likely to notice the substitution of malchus for nisus with whose face he could not have become familiar by this time numbers of the townsmen were as usual coming up to the citadel to worship in the temple or to visit friends dwelling there malchus learned that since his escape had been known each person on entrance received a slip of brass with a stamp on it which he had to give up on leaving all employed in the citadel received a similar voucher without which none could pass the gate the time was now come when the elephants were accustomed to be taken down to the fountains in the town below and the critical moment was at hand the mahout had already begun to prepare his elephant for the part he was to play it had been trumpeting loudly and showing signs of impatience and anger the animal was now made to kneel by the door of its stable where malchus had already lain down at the bottom of the howdah a piece of sacking being thrown over him by the arabs the two arabs and the mahout carried the howdah out placed it on the elephant and securely fastened it in position these howdahs were of rough construction being in fact little more than large open crates for the elephants after being watered went to the forage yard where the crates were filled with freshly cut grass or young boughs of trees which they carried up for their own use to the citadel the mahout took his position on its neck and the elephant then rose to its feet the symptoms of bad temper which it had already given were now redoubled it gave vent to a series of short vicious squeals it trumpeted loudly and angrily and although the mahout appeared to be doing his best to pacify it it became more and more demonstrative the superintendent of the elephants rode up you had better dismount and take that brute back to the stable he said he is not safe to take out this morning as he approached the elephant threw up his trunk opened his mouth and rushed suddenly at him the officer fled hastily shouting loudly to the other mahouts to bring their animals in a circle round the elephant but the mahout gave him a sudden prod with his pricker and the elephant set off with great strides his ears out his trunk in the air and with every sign of an excess of fury at the top of his speed he rushed across the great courtyard the people flying in all directions with shouts of terror he made two or three turns up and down each time getting somewhat nearer to the gate as he approached it for the third time the mahout guided him towards it and accustomed at this hour to sally out the elephant made a sudden rush in that direction the officer on guard shouted to his men to close the gate but before they could attempt to carry out the order the elephant charged through and at the top of his speed went down the road end of chapter 17 recording by edward kirkby warwick england chapter 18 of the young carthaginian this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain 
For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Paige Gannon. The Young Carthaginian, a story of the times of Hannibal, by George Alfred Henty, Chapter Eighteen, Kenny. As the elephant tore down the road to the town, many were the narrow escapes that, as they thought, those coming up had of being crushed or thrown into the air by the angry beast. Some threw themselves on their faces, others got over the parapet and hung by their hands until he had passed, while some squeezed themselves against the wall, but the elephant passed on without doing harm to any. On reaching the foot of the descent, the mahout guided the animal to the left, and, avoiding the busy streets of the town, directed its course toward the more quiet roads of the opulent quarter of Megara. The cries of the people at the approach of the elephant preceded its course, and all took refuge in gardens or houses. The latter became less and less frequent, until, at a distance of two miles from the foot of the citadel, the mahout, on looking round, perceived no one in sight. He brought the elephant suddenly to a standstill. "'Quick, my lord!' he exclaimed. "'Now is the time!' Maltus threw off the sack, climbed out of the howdah, and slipped down by the elephant's tail, the usual plan for dismounting when an elephant is on its feet. Then he sprang a car road, leapt into a garden, and hid himself among some bushes. The mahout now turned to the elephant, and, as if he had succeeded in at last subduing it, slowly retraced his steps toward the citadel. A minute or two later, Malchus issued out and quietly followed it. He had gone some distance when he saw an Arab approaching him, and soon recognized Nessus. They turned off together from the main road, and made their way by by-streets until they reached the lower city. At a spot near the port, they found one of the Arabs from above awaiting them, and he at once led the way to the house inhabited by his family. The scheme had been entirely successful. Malchus had escaped from the citadel without the possibility of a suspicion arising that he had issued from its gates, and in his Arab garb he could now traverse the streets unsuspected. Nessus was overjoyed at the success of the stratagem, and Malchus himself could hardly believe that he had escaped from the terrible danger which had threatened him. Nessus and the Arab at once returned to the citadel. It was agreed that the former had better continue his work as usual until the evening, and then asked for his discharge on the plea that he had received a message requiring his presence in his native village, for it was thought that suspicion might be excited were he to leave suddenly without drawing his pay, and possibly a search might be instituted in the city to discover his whereabouts. At nightfall he returned, and then went to the house of one of the leaders of the Barcine party, with a message from Malchus to tell him where he was, and the events which had occurred since his landing at Carthage, and asking him to receive him privately in two hours' time, in order that he might consult him as to the best plan to be followed. Nessus returned, saying that Manon was at home, and was awaiting him, and the two at once set out for his house. Manon, who was a distant relation of Malchus, received him most warmly, and listened in astonishment to his story of what had befallen him. Malchus then explained the mission with which Hannibal had charged him, and asked his advice as to the best course to be adopted. Manon was silent for a time. Hanno's faction is all-powerful at present, he said, and were Hannibal himself here, I doubt whether his voice could stir the Senate into taking action such as is needed. The times have been hard, and Hanno and his party have lavished money so freely among the lower classes that there is no hope of stirring the populace up to declare against him. I think it would be in the highest degree dangerous were we, as you propose, to introduce you suddenly to the Senate as Hannibal's ambassador to them, and leave you to plead his cause. You would obtain no hearing. Hanno would rise in his place and denounce you as one already condemned by the tribunals as an enemy to the Republic, and would demand your instant execution, and, as he has a great majority of votes in the Senate, his demand would be complied with. You would, I am convinced, throw away your life for no good purpose, while your presence and your mysterious escape from prison would be made the pretense for a fresh series of persecutions of our partisans. I understand as well as you do the urgency for reinforcements being sent to Italy, but in order to do this, the navy, now rotting in our harbors, must be repaired. The command of the sea must be regained, and fresh levies of troops made. 
To ask Carthage to make these sacrifices in her present mood is hopeless. We must await an opportunity. I and my friends will prepare the way. We'll set our agents to work among the people. And when the news of another victory arrives, and the people's hopes are aroused and excited, we will strike while the iron is hot, and call upon them to make one great effort to bring the struggle to a conclusion, and to finish with Rome forever. Such is, in my opinion, the only possible mode of proceeding. To move now would be to ensure a rejection of our demands, to bring fresh persecutions upon us, and so to weaken us that we should be powerless to turn to good account the opportunity which the news of another great victory would afford. I will write at once to Hannibal, and explain all the circumstances of the situation, and will tell him why I have counseled you to avoid carrying out his instructions, seeing that to do so now would be to ensure your own destruction and greatly damage our cause. In the meantime you must, for a short time, remain in concealment, while I arrange for a ship to carry you back to Italy. The sooner the better, Malchus said bitterly, for Carthage with its hideous tyranny, its foul corruption, its forgetfulness of its glory, its honor, and even its safety, is utterly hateful to me. I trust that never again shall I set foot within its walls. Better a thousand times to die in a battlefield than to live in this accursed city. It is natural that you should be indignant, Menon said, for the young blood runs hotly in your veins, and your rage at seeing the fate which is too certainly impending over Carthage, and which you are powerless to prevent, is in no way to be blamed. We old men bow more resignedly to the decrees of the gods. You know the saying, To those whom the gods would destroy, they first strike with madness. Carthage is such. She sees unmoved the heroic efforts which Hannibal and his army are making to save her, and she will not stretch out a hand to aid him. She lives contentedly under the constant tyranny of Hanno's rule, satisfied to be wealthy, luxurious, and slothful, to carry on her trade, to keep her riches, caring nothing for the manly virtues, indifferent to valor, preparing herself slowly and surely to fall an easy prey to Rome. The end probably will not come in my time, it may come in yours, but come it certainly and surely will. A nation which can place a mere handful of its own citizens in the line of battle voluntarily dooms herself to destruction. Whether it comes in my time or not, Malchus said, I will be no sharer in the fate of Carthage. I have done with her, and if I do not fall on the battlefield, I will, when the war is over, seek a refuge among the Gauls, where, if the life is rough, it is at least free and independent, where courage and manliness and honor count for much, and where the enervating influence of wealth is as yet unknown. Such is my firm resolution. I say nothing to dissuade you, Malchus, the old man replied. Such are the natural sentiments of your age, and, methinks, were my own time to come over again, I too would choose such a life in preference to an existence in the polluted atmosphere of ungrateful Carthage. And now, will you stop here with me, or will you return to the place where you are staying? I need not say how gladly I would have you here, but I cannot answer certainly for your safety. Every movement of those belonging to our party is watched by Hanno, and I doubt not that he has his spies among my slaves and servants. Therefore deem me not inhospitable if I say that it were better for you to in hiding where you are. Let your follower come nightly to me for instructions. Let him enter the gate and remain in the garden near it. I will come down and see him. His visits, were they known, would excite suspicion. Bid him on his return, watch closely to see that he is not followed, and tell him to go by devious windings and to mix in the thickest crowds in order to throw any one who may be following off his track before he rejoins you. I trust to be able to arrange for a ship in the course of three or four days. Come again and see me before you leave. Here is a bag of gold. You will need it to reward those who have assisted in your escape. Malchus at once agreed that it would be better for him to return to his abode among the Arabs, and thanking Manon for his kindness, he returned with Nessus, who had been waiting without. As they walked along, Malchus briefly related to his follower the substance of his interview with Manon. Suddenly, Nessus stopped and listened, and then resumed his walk. "'I think we are followed, my lord,' he said. "'One of Hanno's spies in Manon's household is no doubt seeking to discover who are the Arabs who have paid his master a visit. I have thought once before that I heard a footfall. Now I am sure of it. 
When we get to the next turning do, you walk on, and I will turn down the road. If the man behind us be honest, he will go straight on. If he be a spy, he will hesitate and stop at the corner to decide which of us he shall follow. Then I shall know what to do. Accordingly, at the next crossroad they came to, Nessus turned down and concealed himself a few paces away, while Malchus, without pausing, walked straight on. A minute later, Nessus saw a dark figure come stealthily along. He stopped at the junction of the roads and stood for a few seconds in hesitation. Then he followed Malchus. Nessus issued from his hiding place, and, with steps as silent and stealthy as those of a tiger tracking his prey, followed the man. When within a few paces of him, he gave a sudden spring and flung himself upon him, burying his knife between his shoulders. Without a sound, the man fell forward on his face. Nessus coolly wiped his knife upon the garments of the spy, and then proceeded at a rapid pace until he overtook Malchus. It was a spy, he said, but he will carry no more tales to Hanel. Two days later, Nessus, on his return from his visit to Menon, brought news that the latter had arranged with the captain of a ship owned by a friend to carry them across to Corinth, whence they would have no difficulty in taking a passage to Italy. They were to go on board late the following night, and the ship would set sail at daybreak. The next evening, Malchus, accompanied by Nessus, paid a farewell visit to Manon, and repeated to him all the instructions of Hannibal, and Manon handed him his letter for the general, and again assured him that he would, with his friends, at once set to work to pave the way for an appeal to the populace at the first favorable opportunity. After bidding farewell to the old noble, Malchus returned to the house of the Arab, and prepared for his departure. He had already handsomely rewarded the two men, and the Mahout, for the services they had rendered him. In the course of the day, he had provided himself with the garments of a traitor, the character which he was now about to assume. At midnight, when all was quiet, he and Nessus set out and made their way down to the port, where, at a little frequented landing stage, a boat was awaiting them and they were at once rowed to the ship, which was lying at anchor half a mile from the shore in readiness for an early start in the morning. Although it seemed next to impossible that they could have been traced, Malchus walked to the deck restlessly until the morning, listening to every sound, and it was not until the anchor was weighed, the sails hoisted, and the vessel began to draw away from Carthage that he went into his cabin. On the sixth day after leaving Carthage, the ship entered the port of Corinth. There were several vessels there from Italian ports, but before proceeding to arrange for a passage, Malchus went to a shop and bought, for himself and Nessus, such clothing and arms as would enable them to pass without difficulty as fighting men belonging to one of the Latin tribes. Then he made inquiries on the quay, and, finding that a small Italian craft was to start that afternoon for Brindusium, he went on board and accosted the captain. "'We want to cross to Italy,' he said." but we have our reasons for not wishing to land at Brindusium, and would fain be put ashore at some distance from the town. We are ready, of course, to pay extra for the trouble. The request did not seem strange to the captain. Malchus had spoken in Greek, the language with which all who traded on the Mediterranean were familiar. He supposed that they had in some way embroiled themselves with the authorities at Brindusium, and had fled for a while until the matter blew over and that they were now anxious to return to their homes without passing through the town. He asked rather a high price for putting them ashore in a boat as they wished, and Malchus haggled over the sum for a considerable time, as a readiness to pay an exorbitant price might have given rise to doubt in the captain's mind as to the quality of his passengers. Once or twice he made as if he would go ashore, and the captain at last abated his demands to a reasonable sum. When this was settled, Malchus went no more ashore, but remained on board until the vessel sailed, as he feared that he might again be recognized by some of the sailors of the Carthaginian vessels in port. The weather was fair and the wind light, and on the second day after sailing, the vessel lay into a bay a few miles from Brindusium. The boat was lowered, and Malchus and his companions set ashore. They had before embarking laid in the store of provisions, not only for a voyage, but for their journey across the country, as the slight knowledge which Malchus had of the Latin tongue would have betrayed him at once where he obliged to enter a town or village to purchase food. Carrying the provisions in bundles, they made for the mountains, 
and, after three days' journey, reached without interruption or adventure the camp of Hannibal. He was still lying in his entrenched camp near Geronium. The Roman army was, as before, watching him at a short distance off. Malchus at once sought the tent of the general, whose surprise at seeing him enter was great, for he had not expected that he would return until the spring. Malchus gave him an account of all that had taken place since he left him. Hannibal was indignant in the extreme at Hanno having ventured to arrest and condemn his ambassador. When he learned the result of the interview with Menon, and heard how completely the hostile faction were the masters of Carthage, he agreed that the counsels of the old nobleman were wise, and that Malchus could have done no good, whereas he would have exposed himself to almost certain death by endeavoring further to carry out the mission with which he had been charged. Manon knows what is best, and, no doubt, a premature attempt to excite the populace to force Hanno into sending the reinforcements we so much need would have not only failed, but would have injured our cause. He and his friends will doubtless work quietly to prepare the public mind, and I trust that ere very long, some decisive victory will give them the opportunity for exciting a great demonstration on our behalf. The remainder of the winter passed quietly. Malchus resumed his post as the commander of Hannibal's bodyguard, but his duties were very light. The greater part of his time was spent in accompanying Hannibal in his visits to the camps of the soldiers, where nothing was left undone which could add to the comfort and contentment of the troops. There is no stronger evidence of the popularity of Hannibal and of the influence which he exercised over his troops than the fact that the army under him, composed as it was of men of so many nationalities, were the most part originally compelled against their will to enter the service of Carthage, maintained their discipline unshaken, not only by the hardships and sacrifices of their campaigns, but through the long periods of enforced idleness in their winter quarters. From first to last, through the long war, there was neither grumbling, nor discontent, nor insubordination among the troops. They served willingly and cheerfully. They had absolute confidence in their general, and were willing to undertake the most tremendous labors and to engage in the most arduous conflicts to please him, knowing that he, on his part, was unwearied in promoting their comfort and well-being at all other times. As the spring advanced, the great magazines which Hannibal had brought with him became nearly exhausted, and no provisions could be obtained from the surrounding country, which had been completely ruined by the long presence of the two armies. It became, therefore, necessary to move from the position which he had occupied during the winter. The Romans possessed the great advantage over him of having magazines in their rear constantly replenished by their allies, and move where they might, they were sure of obtaining subsistence without difficulty. Thus, upon the march, they were unembarrassed by the necessity of taking a great baggage train with them, and, when halted, their general could keep his army together in readiness to strike a blow whenever an opportunity offered, while Hannibal, on the other hand, was forced to scatter a considerable portion of the army in search of provisions. The annual elections at Rome had just taken place, and Terentius Varro and Aemilius Paulus had been chosen consuls. Aemilius belonged to the aristocratic party, and had given proof of military ability three years before, when he had commanded as consul in the Illyrian War. Varro belonged to the popular party, and is described by the historians of the period as a coarse and brutal demagogue, the son of a butcher and having himself been a butcher. But he was unquestionably an able man, and possessed some great qualities. The praetor Marcellus, who had slain a Gaulish king with his own hand in the last Gaulish War, was at Ostia with a legion. He was destined to command the fleet and to guard the southern coasts of Italy, while another praetor, Lucius Postimius, with one legion, was in Cisalpine Gaul, keeping down the tribes friendly to Carthage. But before the new consuls arrived to take the command of the army, Hannibal had moved from Geronium. The great Roman magazine of Apulia was at Cannae, a town near the river Aulidus. This important place was but fifty miles by the shortest route across the plain from Geronium, but the Romans were unable to follow directly across the plain, for at this time the Carthaginians greatly outnumbered them in cavalry, and they would, therefore, have to take the road round the foot of the mountains, 
which was nearly seventy miles long, and yet, by some unaccountable blunder, they neglected to place a sufficient guard over their great magazines at Cannae to defend them for even a few days against a sudden attack. Hannibal saw the opportunity, and when spring was passing into summer, broke up his camp and marched straight to Cannae, where the vast magazines of the Romans at once fell into his hands. He thus not only obtained possession of his enemy's supplies, but interposed between the Romans and the low-lying district of southern Apulia, where alone, at this early season of the year, the corn was fully ripe. The Romans had now no choice but to advance and fight a battle for the recovery of their magazines, for, had they retired, the Apulians, who had already suffered terribly from the war, would, in sheer despair, have been forced to declare for Carthage, while it would have been extremely difficult to continue any longer the waiting tactics of Fabius, as they would now have been obliged to draw their provisions from a distance, while Hannibal could victual his army from the country behind him. The Senate, therefore, having largely reinforced the army, ordered the consuls to advance and give battle. They had under them eight full legions, or eighty thousand infantry, and seven thousand two hundred cavalry. To oppose these, Hannibal had forty thousand infantry, and ten thousand excellent cavalry, of whom two thousand were Numidians. On the second day after leaving the neighborhood of Geronium, the Romans encamped at a distance of six miles from the Carthaginians. Here, the usual difference of opinion at once arose between the Roman consuls, who commanded the army on alternate days. Varro wished to march against the enemy without delay, while Emilius was adverse to risking an engagement in a country which, being level and open, was favorable to the action of Hannibal's superior cavalry. On the following day, Varro, whose turn it was to command, marched towards the hostile camp. Hannibal attacked the Roman advance guard with his cavalry and light infantry, but Varro had supported his cavalry not only by his light troops, but by a strong body of his heavy armed infantry, and, after an engagement which lasted for several hours, he repulsed the Carthaginians with considerable loss. That evening, the Roman army encamped about three miles from Cannae, on the right bank of the Alphidus. The next morning, Emilius, who was in command, detached a third of his force across the river, and encamped them there for the purpose of supporting the Roman foraging parties on that side and of interrupting those of the Carthaginians. The next day passed quietly, but on the following morning Hannibal quitted his camp and formed his army in order of battle to tempt the Romans to attack. But Emilius, sensible that the ground was against him, would not move, but contented himself with further strengthening his camps. Hannibal, seeing that the Romans would not fight, detached his Numidian cavalry across the river to cut off the Roman foraging parties and to surround and harass their smaller camp on that side of the river. On the following morning, Hannibal, knowing that Varro would be in command, and feeling sure that, with his impetuous disposition, the consul would be burning to avenge the insult offered by the surrounding of his camp by the Numidians, moved his army across the river and formed it in order of battle leaving eight thousand of his men to guard his camp. By thus doing, he obtained a position which he could the better hold with his inferior forces, while the Romans, deeming that he intended to attack their camp on that side of the river, would be likely to move their whole army across and to give battle. This, in fact, Varro proceeded to do, leaving ten thousand men in his own camp with orders to march out and attack that of Hannibal during the engagement. He led the rest of his troops over the river, and having united his force with that in the camp on the right bank, marched down the river until he faced the position which Hannibal had taken up. This had been skillfully chosen. The river, whose general course was east and west, made a loop, and across this Hannibal had drawn up his army with both wings resting upon the river. Thus the Romans could not outflank him, and the effect of their vastly superior numbers in infantry would to some extent be neutralized. The following was the disposition of his troops. The Spaniards and Gauls occupied the center of the line of infantry. The Africans formed the two wings. On his left flank between the Africans and the river, he placed his heavy African and Gaulish horse, 8,000 strong, while the 2,000 Numidians were posted between the infantry and the river on the right flank. 
Hannibal commanded the center of the army in person. Hanno, the right wing. Hasdrubal, the left wing. Maharbal commanded the cavalry. Varro placed his infantry in close and heavy order, so as to reduce their front to that of the Carthaginians. The Roman cavalry, numbering 2,400 men, was on his right wing, and was thus opposed to Hannibal's heavy cavalry, 8,000 strong. The cavalry of the Italian allies, 4,800 strong, was on the left wing facing the Numidians. Emilius commanded the Roman right, Varro the left. The Carthaginians faced north, so that the wind, which was blowing strongly from the south, swept clouds of dust over their heads full into the faces of the enemy. The battle was commenced by the light troops on both sides, who fought for some time obstinately and courageously, but without any advantage to either. While this contest was going on, Hannibal advanced his center so as to form a salient angle projecting in front of his line. The whole of the Gauls and Spaniards took part in this movement, while the Africans remained stationary. At the same time, he launched his heavy cavalry against the Roman horse. The latter were instantly overthrown, and were driven from the field with great slaughter. Emilius himself was wounded, but managed to join the infantry. While the Carthaginian heavy horse were thus defeating the Roman cavalry, the Numidians maneuvered near the greatly superior cavalry of the Italian allies, and kept them occupied until the heavy horse, after destroying the Roman cavalry, swept round behind their infantry and fell upon the rear of the Italian horse, while the Numidians charged them fiercely in front. Thus caught in a trap, the Italian horse were completely annihilated, and so, before the heavy infantry of the two armies met each other, not a Roman cavalry soldier remained alive and unwounded on the field. The Roman infantry now advanced to the charge, and from the nature of Hannibal's formation, their center first came in contact with the head of the salient angle formed by the Gauls and Spaniards. These resisted with great obstinacy. The princeps, who formed the second line of the Roman infantry, came forward and joined the spearmen, and even the triarii pressed forward and joined in the fight. Fighting with extreme obstinacy, the Carthaginian center was forced gradually back, until they were again in a line with the Africans on their flanks. The Romans had insensibly pressed in from both flanks upon the point where they had met with resistance, and now occupied a face scarcely more than half that which they had begun the battle. Still further, the Gauls and Spaniards were driven back, until they now formed an angle in rear of the original line, and in this angle the whole of the Roman infantry in a confused mass pressed upon them. This was the moment for which Hannibal had waited. He wheeled round both his flanks, and the Africans who had hitherto not struck a blow now fell in perfect order upon the flanks of the Roman mass, while Hasdrubal with his victorious cavalry charged down like a torrent upon their rear. Then followed a slaughter unequaled in the records of history. Unable to open out, to fight or to fly, with no quarter asked or given, the Romans and their Latin allies fell before the swords of their enemies, till, of the seventy thousand infantry which had advanced to the fight, forty thousand had fallen on the field. Three thousand were taken prisoners, seven thousand escaped to the small camp, and ten thousand made their way across the river to the large camp, where they joined the force which had been left there, and which had, in obedience to Varro's orders, attacked the Carthaginian camp but had been repulsed with a loss of two thousand men. All the troops in both camps were forced to surrender on the following morning, and thus only fifteen thousand scattered fugitives escaped of the eighty-seven thousand two hundred infantry and cavalry under the command of the Roman consuls. Hannibal's loss in the Battle of Cannae amounted to about six thousand men. End of chapter 18「Chapter Nineteen of the Young Carthaginian. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Brett Downey. The Young Carthaginian. A Story of the Times of Hannibal. By George Alfred Henty. Chapter Nineteen. In the Mines. The exultation of the Carthaginians at the total destruction of their enemies was immense and Marhobol and some of the other leaders urged Hannibal at once to march upon Rome. But Hannibal knew the spirit of the Roman people, and felt that the capture of Rome, even after the annihilation of its army, would be a greater task than he could undertake. 
history has shown how desperate a defense may be made by a population willing to die rather than surrender and the romans an essentially martial people would defend their city until the last gasp they had an abundance of arms and there were the two city legions which formed the regular garrison of the capital the instant the news of the defeat reached rome a levy of all males over seventeen years of age was ordered and this produced another ten thousand men and a thousand cavalry eight thousand slaves who were willing to serve were enlisted and armed and four thousand criminals and debtors were released from prison and pardoned on the condition of their taking up arms the praetor marcellus was at ostia with the ten thousand men with which he was about to embark for sicily thus rome would be defended by forty three thousand men while hannibal had but thirty three thousand infantry and his cavalry the strongest arm of his force would be useless from cannae to rome was twelve days march with an army encumbered with booty he could not therefore hope for a surprise the walls of rome were exceedingly strong and he had with him none of the great machines which would have been necessary for a siege he must have carried with him the supplies he had accumulated for the subsistence of his force and when these were consumed he would be destitute fresh roman levies would gather on his rear and before long his whole army would be besieged in such an undertaking he would have wasted time and lost the prestige which he had acquired by his astonishing victory varro who had escaped from the battle had rallied ten thousand of the fugitives at the strong place of canusium and these would be a nucleus round which the rest of those who had escaped would rally and would be joined by fresh levies of the italian allies of rome the romans showed their confidence in their power to resist a siege by at once dispatching marcellus with his ten thousand men to canusium thus with a strongly defended city in front an army of twenty thousand roman soldiers which would speedily increase to double that number in his rear hannibal perceived that were he to undertake the siege of rome he would risk all the advantages he had gained he determined therefore to continue the policy which he had laid down for himself namely to move his army to and fro among the provinces of italy until the allies of rome one by one fell away from her and joined him or until such reinforcements arrived from carthage as would justify him in undertaking the siege of rome rome herself was never grander than in this hour of defeat not for a moment was the courage and confidence of her citizens shaken the promptness with which she prepared for defence and still more the confidence which she showed by dispatching marcellus with his legion to canusium instead of retaining him for the defence of the city showed a national spirit and manliness worthy of the highest admiration varro was ordered to hand over his command to marcellus and to return to rome to answer before the senate for his conduct varro doubted not that his sentence would be death for the romans like the carthaginians had but little mercy for a defeated general his colleague and his army had undoubtedly been sacrificed by his rashness moreover the senate was composed of his bitter political enemies and he could not hope that a lenient view would be taken of his conduct nevertheless varro returned to rome and appeared before the senate that body nobly responded to the confidence manifested in it party feeling was suspended the political adversary the defeated general were alike forgotten it was only remembered how varro had rallied his troops how he had allayed the panic which prevailed among them and had at once restored order and discipline his courage too in thus appearing after so great a disaster to submit himself to the judgment of the country counted in his favor his faults were condoned and the senate publicly thanked him because he had not despaired of the commonwealth hannibal in pursuance of his policy to detach the allies of italy from rome dismissed all the italian prisoners without ransom the roman prisoners he offered to admit to ransom and a deputation of them accompanied an ambassador to offer terms of peace the senate however not only refused to discuss any terms of peace but absolutely forbade the families and friends of the prisoners to ransom them thinking it politic neither to enrich their adversary nor to show indulgence to soldiers who had surrendered to the enemy the victory of cannae and hannibal's clemency began to bear the effects which he hoped for apulia declared for him at once and the towns of arpi and salapia opened their gates to him brutium lucania and samnium were ready to follow mago with one division of the army was sent into brutium to take possession of such towns as might submit hanno was sent with another division to do the same in lucania hannibal himself marched into samnium and making an alliance with the tribes there stored his plunder and proceeded into capania and entered capua the second city of italy which concluded an alliance with him mago embarked at one of the ports of brutium to carry the news of hannibal's success to carthage and to demand reinforcements neither rome nor carthage had the complete mastery of the sea 
and as the disaster which had befallen Rome by land would greatly lessen her power to maintain a large fleet, Carthage could now have poured reinforcements in by the ports of Brutium without difficulty. But unfortunately, Hannibal's bitterest enemies were to be found not in Italy, but in the Senate of Carthage, where, in spite of the appeals of Mago and the efforts of the patriotic party, the intrigues of Hanno and his faction, and the demands made by the war in Spain, prevented the reinforcements from being forwarded, which would have enabled him to terminate the struggle by the conquest of Rome. Hannibal, after receiving the submission of several other towns and capturing Cassilinum, went into winter quarters at Capua. During the winter, Rome made gigantic efforts to place her army upon a war footing, and with such success that, excluding the army of Scipio in Spain, she had, when the spring began, twelve legions, or a hundred and twenty thousand men again under arms, and as no reinforcements, save some elephants and a small body of cavalry, ever reached Hannibal from Carthage, he was, during the remaining thirteen years of the war, reduced to stand wholly on the defensive, protecting his allies, harassing his enemy, and feeding his own army at their expense. And yet so great was the dread which his genius had excited that, in spite of their superior numbers, the Romans, after Cannae, never ventured again to engage him in a pitched battle. Soon after the winter set in, Hannibal ordered Malchus to take a number of officers and a hundred picked men, and to cross from Capua to Sardinia, where the inhabitants had revolted against Rome, and were harassing the praetor Quintus Musius, who had commanded the legion which formed the garrison of the island. Malchus and the officers under him were charged with the duty of organizing the wild peasantry of the island, and of drilling them in regular tactics. For unless, acting as bodies of regular troops, however much they might harass the Roman legion, they could not hope to expel them from their country. Nessus, of course, accompanied Malchus. The party embarked in two of the Capuan galleys. They had not been many hours at sea when the weather, which had when they started been fine, changed suddenly, and ere long one of the fierce gales which are so frequent in the Mediterranean burst upon them. The wind was behind them, and there was nothing to do but to let the galleys run before it. The sea got up with great rapidity, and nothing but the high poops at their stern prevented the two galleys being sunk by the great waves which followed them. The oars were laid in, for it was impossible to use them in such a sea. As night came on, the gale increased rather than diminished. The Carthaginian officers and soldiers remained calm and quiet in the storm, but the Capuan sailors gave themselves up to despair, and the men at the helm were only kept at their post by Malchus, threatening to have them thrown overboard instantly, if they abandoned it. After nightfall, he assembled the officers in the cabin in the poop. The prospects are bad, he said. The pilot tells me that unless the gale abates or the wind changes, we shall, before morning, be thrown upon the coast of Sardinia, and that will be total destruction, for upon the side facing Italy, the cliffs, for the most part, rise straight up from the water, the only port on that side being that at which the Romans have their chief castle and garrison. He tells me there is nothing to be done, and I see not myself. Were we to try to bring the galley round to the wind, she would be swamped in a moment. Well, even if we could carry out the operation, it would be impossible to row in the teeth of this sea. Therefore, my friends, there is nothing for us to do save to keep up the courage of the men, and to bid them hold themselves in readiness to seize upon any chance of getting to shore should the vessel strike. All night the galley swept on before the storm. The light on the other boat had disappeared soon after darkness had set in. Half the soldiers and crew by turns were kept at work, bailing out the water which found its way over the sides, and several times so heavily did the seas break into her that all thought she was lost. However, when morning broke she was still afloat. The wind had hardly shifted a point since it had begun to blow, and the pilot told Malchus that they must be very near to the coast of Sardinia. As the light brightened, every eye was fixed ahead over the waste of angry, foaming water. Presently the pilot, who was standing next to Malchus, grasped his arm. "'There is the land!' he cried. "'Dead before us!' Not until a few minutes later could Malchus make out the faint outline through the driving mist. It was a lofty pile of rock standing by itself. "'It is an island!' he exclaimed. "'It is careless, the pilot replied. "'I know its outline well. We are already in the bay. Look to the right. You can make out the outline of the cliffs at its mouth. We have passed it already.' You do not see the shore ahead because the rock on which Carolus stands rises from a level plain, and to the left a lagoon extends for a long way in. It is there that the Roman galleys ride. The gods have brought us to the only spot along the coast where we could approach it with a hope of safety. There is not much to rejoice at, Malchus said. We may escape the sea, but only to be made prisoners by the Romans. Nay, Malchus, the alternative is not so bad, a young officer who was standing next to him said. 
Hannibal has thousands of Roman prisoners in his hands, and we may well hope to be exchanged. After the last twelve hours, any place on shore, even a Roman prison, is an Elysium compared to the sea. The outline of the coast was now clearly visible. The great rock of Carolus, now known as Cagliari, rose dark and threatening. The low shores of the bay on either side were marked by a band of white foam, while to the left of the rock was the broad lagoon, dotted with the black hulls of a number of ships and galleys, rolling and tossing heavily, for as the wind blew straight into the bay, the lagoon was covered with short, angry waves. The pilot now ordered the oars to be got out. The entrance to the lagoon was wide, but it was only in the middle that the channel was deep, and on either side of this long breakwaters of stone were run out from the shore to afford a shelter to the shipping within. The sea was so rough that it was found impossible to use the oars, and they were again laid in and a small sail was hoisted. This enabled the head to be laid towards the entrance of the lagoon. For a time it was doubtful whether the galley could make it, but she succeeded in doing so and then ran straight on towards the upper end of the harbor. That is far enough, the pilot said presently. The water shoals fast beyond. We must anchor here. The sail was lowered, and the oars got out on one side, and the head of the galley brought to the wind. The anchor was then dropped. As the storm-beaten galley ran right up the lagoon, she had been viewed with curiosity and interest by those who were on board the ships at anchor. That she was an Italian galley was clear, and also that she was crowded with men, but no suspicion was entertained that these were Carthaginians. The anchor once cast, Malchus held a council with the other officers. They were in the midst of foes, and escape seemed altogether impossible. Long before the gale abated sufficiently to permit them to put to sea again, they would be visited by boats from the other vessels to ask who they were and whence they came. As to fighting their way out, it was out of the question, for there were a score of triremes in the bay, any one of which could crush the Capuan galley, and whose far greater speed rendered the idea of flight as hopeless as that of resistance. The council therefore agreed unanimously that the only thing to be done was to surrender without resistance. The storm continued for another twenty-four hours, then the wind died out almost as suddenly as it began. As soon as the sea began to abate, two galleys were seen putting out from the town, and these rowed directly towards the ship. The fact that she had shown no flag had no doubt excited suspicion in the minds of the garrison. Each galley contained fifty soldiers. As they rowed alongside, a Roman officer on the poop of one of the galleys hailed the ship and demanded whence it came. "'We are from Capua,' the pilot answered. "'The gale has blown us across thence. I have on board fifty Carthaginian officers and soldiers, who now surrender to you.' As in those days, when vessels could with difficulty keep the sea in a storm, and in the event of a gale springing up were forced to run before it, it was by no means unusual for galleys to be blown into hostile ports. The announcement excited no great surprise. "'Who commands the party?' the Roman officer asked. "'I do,' Malchus replied. "'I am Malchus, son of Hamilcar, who was killed at the Trebia, a cousin of Hannibal and captain of his guard. I surrender with my followers, seeing that resistance is hopeless.' "'It is hopeless.' the Roman replied, and you are right not to throw away the lives of your men when there is no possibility of resistance. As he spoke, he stepped on board, ordered the anchor to be weighed, and the galley, accompanied by the two Roman boats, was rowed to the landing place. A messenger was at once sent up to Musius to tell him what had happened, and the praetor himself soon appeared upon the spot. The officer acquainted him with the name and rank of the leader of the Carthaginian party, and said that there were with him two officers of noble families of the Carthaginians. That is well, the praetor said. It is a piece of good fortune. The Carthaginians have so many of our officers in their hands that it is well to have some whom we may exchange for them. Let them be landed. As they left the ship, the Carthaginians laid down their arms and armor. By this time, a large number of the Roman garrison, among whom the news had rapidly spread, were assembled at the port. Many of the young soldiers had never yet seen a Carthaginian, and they looked with curiosity and interest at the men who had inflicted such terrible defeats upon the armies of the Romans. They were fine specimens of Hannibal's force, for the general had allowed Malchus to choose his own officers and men, and, knowing that strength, agility, and endurance would be needed for a campaign in so mountainous a country as Sardinia, he had picked both officers and men with great care. His second-in-command was his friend Trebon, who had long since obtained a separate command, but who, on hearing from Malchus of the expedition on which he was bound, had volunteered to accompany him. The men were all Africans, accustomed to desert fighting and trained in warfare in Spain. The Romans, good judges of physical strength, could not repress a murmur of admiration at the sight of these sinewy figures. Less heavy than themselves, there was about them a spring and an elasticity resembling that of the tiger. 
Long use had hardened their muscles until they stood up like cords through their tawny skin. Most of them bore numerous scars of wounds received in battle, and the Romans, as they viewed them, acknowledged to themselves what formidable opponents these men would be. A strong guard formed up on either side of the captives, and they were marched through the town to the citadel on the upper part of the rock. Here a large chamber, opening on to the courtyard, was assigned to the officers, while the men, who were viewed in the light of slaves, were at once set to work to carry stores up to the citadel from a ship which had just arrived as the storm broke. A fortnight later a vessel arrived from Rome with a message from the Senate that they would not exchange prisoners, and that the Carthaginians were at once to be employed as slaves in the mines. The governor acquainted Malchus with the decision. "'I am sorry,' he said. "'Indeed that it is so, but the Senate are determined that they will exchange no prisoners.' Of course, their view of the matter is that when a Roman lays down his arms, he disgraces himself, and the refusal to ransom him or to allow him to be exchanged is intended to act as a deterrent to others. This may be fair enough in cases where large numbers surrender to a few, or they lay down their arms when, with courage and determination, they might have cut their way through the enemy. But in cases where further resistance would be hopeless, in my mind, men are justified in surrendering. However, I can only obey the orders I have received and tomorrow must send you and your men to the mines. As Malchus had seen the Iberian captives sent to labor as slaves in the mines in Spain, the fate thus announced to him did not appear surprising or barbarous. In those days, captives taken in war were always made slaves when they were not put to death in cold blood, and although Hannibal had treated with marked humanity and leniency the Romans and Italian captives who had fallen into his hands, this had been the result of policy, and was by no means in accordance with the spirit in which war was then conducted. Accordingly, the next day the Carthaginians were, under a strong guard, marched away to the mines, which lay on the other side of the island, some forty miles due west of the port, and three miles from the western seacoast of the island. The road lay for some distance across a dead flat. The country was well cultivated and thickly studded with villages, for Rome drew a heavy tribute in corn annually from the island. After twenty miles' march they halted for the night, pursuing their way on the following morning. They had now entered a wide and fertile valley with lofty hills on either side. In some places there were stagnant marshes, and the officer in charge of the guard informed Malchus that in the autumn a pestilential miasma arose from these, rendering a sojourn in the valley fatal to the inhabitants of the mainland. The native people were wild and primitive in appearance, being clad chiefly in sheepskins. They lived in beehive-shaped huts. The hills narrowed in towards the end of the day's march, and the valley terminated when the party arrived within half a mile of their destination. Here stood a small town named Metella, with a strong Roman garrison which supplied guards over the slaves employed in working the mines. This town is now called Iglesias. The principal mine was situated in a narrow valley running west from the town down to the seacoast. The officer in command of the escort handed Malchus and his companions to the charge of the officer at the head mining establishment. Malchus was surprised at the large number of people gathered at the spot. They lived for the most part in low huts constructed of boughs or sods, and ranged in lines at the bottom of the valley or along the lower slopes of the hill. A cordon of Roman sentries was placed along the crest of the hill at either side, and a strong guard was posted in a little camp in the center of the valley, in readiness to put down any tumult which might arise. The great majority of the slaves gathered there were sards, men belonging to the tribes which had risen in insurrection against the Romans. There were with them others of their countrymen, who were not like them slaves, though their condition was but little better except that they received a nominal rate of payment. These were called free laborers, but their labor was as much forced as that of the slaves, each district in the island being compelled to furnish a certain amount of laborers for this or the mines further to the north. The men so conscripted were changed once in six months. With the Sards were mingled people of many nations. Here were Sicilians and members of the Italian tribes conquered by the Romans, together with Gauls from the northern plains and from Marseilles. There were many mines worked in different parts of the island, but Metella was the principal. The labor, in days when gunpowder had not become the servant of man, was extremely hard. The rocks had to be pierced with hand labor. The passages and galleries were of the smallest possible dimensions. The atmosphere was stifling. Consequently, the mortality was great and it was necessary to keep up a constant importation of labor. If these people did but possess a particle of courage, Trebon said, they would rise, overpower the guard, and make for the forest. The whole island is, as the officer who brought us here told us, covered with mountains, with the exception of the two broad plains running through it. As we could see, 
the hills are covered with woods, and the whole Roman army could not find them if they once escaped. That is true enough, Malchus said, but there must be at least five or six thousand slaves here. How could these find food among the mountains? They might exist for a time upon berries and grain, but they would in the end be forced to go into the valleys for food, and would then be slaughtered by the Romans. Nevertheless, a small body of men could, no doubt, subsist among the hills, and the strength of the guard you see on the heights shows that attempts to escape are not rare. Should we find our existence intolerable here, we will at any rate try to escape. There are fifty of us, and if we agree in common action, we could certainly break through the guards and take to the hills. As you may see by their faces, the spirit of these slaves is broken. See how bent most of them are by their labor, and how their shoulders are wheeled by the lashes of their taskmasters. The officer in charge of the mines told Malchus that he should not put him and the other two officers to labor, but would appoint them as overseers over gangs of men, informing them that he had a brother who was at present a captive in the hands of Hannibal, and he trusted that Malchus, should he have an opportunity, would use his kind offices on his behalf. One of the lines of huts near the Roman camp was assigned to the Carthaginians, and that evening they received rations of almost black bread similar to those served out to the others. The following morning they were set to work. Malchus and his two friends found their task by no means laborious as they were appointed to look after a number of sards employed in breaking up and sorting the lead ore as it was brought up from the mine. The men, however, returned in the evening worn out with toil. All had been at work in the mines. Some had had to crawl long distances through passages little more than three feet high and one foot wide till they reached the broad load of lead ore. Here some of the party had been set to work. Others had been employed in pushing on the little galleries, and there had sat for hours working in a cramped position with pick hammer and wedge. Others had been lowered by ropes down shafts so narrow that when they got to the bottom it was only with extreme difficulty that they were able to stoop to work at the rock beneath their feet. Many indeed of these old shafts have been found in the mines of Montepone, so extremely narrow that it is supposed that they must have been bored by slaves lowered by ropes head foremost, it appearing absolutely impossible for a man to stoop to work if lowered in the ordinary way. The Carthaginians, altogether unaccustomed to work of this nature, returned to their huts at night utterly exhausted, cramped and aching in every limb. Many had been cruelly beaten for not performing the tasks assigned to them. All were filled with a dull, despairing rage. In the evening a ration of boiled beans, with a little native wine, was served out to each, the quantity of the food being ample, it being necessary to feed the slaves well to enable them to support their fatigues. After three days of this work, five or six of the captives were so exhausted that they were unable to take their places with the gang when ordered for work in the morning. They were, however, compelled by blows to rise and take their places with the rest. Two of them died during the course of the day in their stifling working places, another succumbed during the night. Several, too, were attacked by the fever of the country. Malchus and his friends were full of grief and rage at the sufferings of their men. Anything were better than this, Malchus said. A thousand times better to fall beneath the swords of the Romans than to die like dogs in the holes beneath that hill. I quite agree with you, Malchus, Halco, the other officer with the party, said, and I am ready to join you in any plan of escape, however desperate. The difficulty is about arms, Trebon observed. We are so closely watched that it is out of the question to hope that we should succeed in getting possession of any. The tools are all left in the mines, and as the men work naked, there is no possibility of secreting any. The stores here are always guarded by a sentry, and although we might overpower him, the guard would arrive long before we could break through the solid doors. Of course, if we could get the other slaves to join us, we might crush the guard even with stones. That is out of the question, Malchus said. In the first place, they speak a strange language, quite different to the Italians. Then, were we seen trying to converse with any of them, suspicions might be roused, and even could we get the majority to join us, there would be many who would be only too glad to purchase their own freedom by betraying the plot to the Romans. No, whatever we do must be done by ourselves alone, and for arms we must rely upon stones, and upon the stoutest stakes we can draw out from our huts. The only time that we have free to ourselves is the hour after work is over, when we are allowed to go down to the stream to wash, and to stroll about, as we will, until the trumpet sounds to order us to retire to our huts for the night. It is true that at that time the guards are particularly vigilant, and that we are not allowed to gather into knots, and an Italian slave I spoke to yesterday told me that he dared not speak to me, for the place swarms with spies, and that any conversation between us would be sure to be reported. 
and those engaged in it to be put to the hardest and cruelest work. I propose, therefore, that tomorrow, for if it is to be done, the sooner the better, before the men lose all their strength, the men shall, on their return from work, at once eat their rations. Then each man, hiding a short stick under his garment and wrapping a few heavy stones in the corner of his robe, shall make his way up towards the top of the hill above the mine. No two men must go together. All must wander as if aimlessly among the huts. When they reach the upper line on that side and see me, let all rapidly close up, and we will make a sudden rush at the sentries above. They cannot get more than five or six together in time to oppose us, and we shall be able to beat them down with our stones. Once through them, the heavy-armed men will never be able to overtake us till we reach the forest, which begins, I believe, about half a mile beyond the top. The other two officers at once agreed to the plan, and when the camp was still, Malchus crept cautiously from hut to hut, telling his men of the plan that had been formed, and giving orders for the carrying out of it. All assented cheerfully, for although the stronger were now becoming accustomed to their work, and felt less exhausted than they had done the first two days, there was not one but felt that he would rather suffer death than endure this terrible fate. Malchus impressed upon them strongly that it was of the utmost consequence to possess themselves of the arms of any Roman soldiers they might overthrow, as they would be to a great extent be compelled to rely upon these to obtain food among the mountains. Even the men who were most exhausted, and those stricken with fever, seemed to gain strength at once at the prospect of a struggle for liberty, and when the gang turned out in the morning for work, none lagged behind. End of chapter 19 Recording by Brett Downey Chapter 20 of The Young Carthaginian. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Brett Downey. The Young Carthaginian, A Story of the Times of Hannibal by George Alfred Henty. Chapter 20 The Sardinian Forests. The Carthaginians returned in the evening in groups from the various scenes of their labor and without delay consumed the provisions provided for them. Then, one by one, they sauntered away down towards the stream. Malchus was the last to leave, and having seen that all his followers had preceded him, he too crossed the stream, paused a moment at a heap of debris from the mine, and picked up three or four pieces of rock about the size of his fist, rolled them in the corner of his garment, and holding this in one hand, moved up the hill. Here and there he paused a moment, as if interested in watching the groups of slaves eating their evening meal, until at last he reached the upper line of the little huts. Between these and the hilltop upon which the sentry stood was a distance of about fifty yards, which was kept scrupulously clear to enable them to watch the movements of any man going beyond the huts. The sentries were some thirty paces apart, so that, as Malchus calculated, not more than four or five of them could assemble before he reached them, if they did not previously perceive anything suspicious which might put them on the alert. Looking round him, Malchus saw his followers scattered about among the slaves at a short distance, Standing behind the shelter of the hut, he raised his hand, and all began to move towards him. As there was nothing in their attire, which consisted of one long cloth wound round them, to distinguish them from the other slaves, the movement attracted no attention from the sentries, who were, from their position, able to overlook the low huts. When he saw that all were close, Malchus gave a shout and dashed up the hill, followed by his comrades. The nearest sentry, seeing a body of fifty men suddenly rushing towards him, raised a shout, and his comrades from either side ran towards him. But so quickly was the movement performed that but five had gathered when the Carthaginians reached them, although many others were running towards the spot. The Carthaginians, when they came close to their leveled spears, poured upon them a shower of heavy stones, which knocked two of them down, and so bruised and battered the others, that they went down at once when the Carthaginians burst upon them. The nearest Romans halted to await the arrival of their comrades coming up behind them, and the Carthaginians, seizing the swords spears and shields of their fallen foes dashed on at full speed the romans soon followed but with the weight of their weapons armor and helmets they were speedily distanced and the fugitives reached the edge of the forest in safety and dashed into its recesses after running for some distance they halted knowing that the romans would not think of pursuing except with a large force the forests which covered the mountains of sardinia were for the most part composed of evergreen oak with, in some places, a thick undergrowth of shrubs and young trees. Through this the Carthaginians made their way with some difficulty, until, just as it became dark, they reached the bottom of a valley comparatively free of trees, and through which ran a clear stream. Here we will halt for the night, Malchus said. 
There is no fear of the Romans pursuing at once, if indeed they do so at all, for their chance of finding us in these mountains, covered with hundreds of square miles of forests, is slight indeed. However, we will at once provide ourselves with weapons. If five Roman swords were put into requisition, and some straight young saplings were felled, and their points being sharpened, they were converted into efficient spears, each some fourteen feet long. It is well we have supped, Malchus said. Our breakfast will depend on ourselves. Tomorrow we must keep a sharp lookout for some smoke rising through the trees. There are sure to be numbers of charcoal burners in the forest, for upon them the Romans depend for their fuel. One of the first things to do is to obtain a couple of lighted brands. A fire is essential for warmth among these hills, even putting aside its uses for cooking. That is when we have anything to cook, Halco said laughingly. That is certainly essential, Malchus agreed. But there is sure to be plenty of wild boar and deer among these forests. We have only to find a valley with a narrow entrance and post ourselves down there and send all the men to form a circle on the hills around it and drive them down to us. Besides, most likely we shall come across herds of goats and pigs, which the villagers in the lower valleys will send up to feed on the acorns. I have no fear, but we shall be able to obtain plenty of flesh. As to corn, we have only to make a raid down into the plain, and when we have found out something about the general lay of the country, the hills and the extent of the forest, we will choose some spot near its center and erect huts there. If it were not for the peasants, we might live here for years, for all the Roman forces in Sardinia would be insufficient to rout us out of these mountains. But unfortunately, as we shall have to rob the peasants, they will act as guides to the Romans, and we shall be obliged to keep a sharp lookout against surprise. If it gets too hot for us, we must make a night march across the plain to the mountains on the eastern side. I heard at Carolus that the wild part there is very much larger than it is on this side of the island, and it extends without a break from the port right up to the north of the island. Safe as he felt from pursuit, Malchus posted four men as sentries, and the rest of the band lay down to sleep, rejoicing in the thought that on the morrow they should not be wakened to take their share in the labors in the mine. At daybreak all were on the move, and a deep spot, having been found in the stream, they indulged in the luxury of a bath. That done, they started on the march further into the heart of the forest. The hills were of great height, and bare crags often beetling up among the trees hundreds of feet, with deep valleys and rugged precipices. In crossing one of these valleys, Nessus suddenly lifted his hand. "'What is it?' Malchus asked. "'I heard a pig grunt,' Nessus replied. "'On our right, there!' Malchus at once divided the band in two and told them to proceed as quietly as possible along the lower slopes of the hill, leaving a man at every fifteen paces. When all had been posted, the ends of the line were to descend until they met in the middle of the valley, thus forming a circle. A shout was to tell the rest that this was done, and then all were to move down until they met in the center. One officer went with each party. Malchus remained at the spot where he was standing. In ten minutes the signal was heard, and then all moved forward, shouting as they went, and keeping a sharp lookout between the trees to see that nothing passed them. As the narrowing circle issued into the open ground at the bottom of the valley, there was a general shout of delight, for, huddled down by a stream, grunting and screaming with fright, was a herd of forty or fifty pigs, with a peasant, who appeared stupefied with alarm at the sudden uproar. On seeing the men burst out with their leveled spears from the wood, the sard gave a scream of terror and threw himself upon his face. When the Carthaginians came up to him, Malchus stirred him with his foot, but he refused to move. He then pricked him with the Roman spear he held, and the man leaped to his feet with a shout. Malchus told him in Italian that he was free to go, but that the swine must be confiscated for the use of his followers. The man did not understand his words, but seeing by his gestures that he was free to go, set off at the top of his speed, hardly believing that he could have escaped with his life, and in no way concerned at the loss of the herd. This was, indeed, the property of various individuals in one of the villages at the foot of the hills. It being then, as now, the custom for several men owning swine to send them together under the charge of a herdsman into the mountains, where for months together they live in a half-wild state on acorns and roots, a villager going up occasionally with supplies of food for the swineherd. No sooner had the peasant disappeared than a shout from one of the men some fifty yards away called the attention of Malchus. "'Here is the man's fire, my lord!' A joyous exclamation rose from the soldiers, for the thought of all this meat and no means of cooking it was tantalizing every one. Malchus hurried to the spot, where indeed was a heap of still glowing embers. Some of the men at once set to work to collect dry sticks, and in a few minutes a great fire was blazing. One of the pigs was slaughtered and cut up into rations, and in a short time each man was cooking his portion stuck on a stick over the fire. A smaller fire was lit for the use of the officers a short distance away, 
and here Nessus prepared their share of the food for Malchus and his two companions. After the meal, the spears were improved by the points being hardened in the fire. When they were in readiness to march, two of the men were told off as firekeepers, and each of these took two blazing brands from the fire, which, as they walked, they kept crossed before them, the burning points keeping each other alight. Even with one man there would be little chance of losing the fire, but with two such a misfortune could scarcely befall them. A party of ten men took charge of the herd of swine, and the whole then started for the point they intended to make to in the heart of the mountains. Before the end of the day a suitable camping place was selected in a watered valley. The men then set to work to cut down boughs and erect arbors. Fires were lighted, and another pig being killed, those who preferred it roasted his flesh over the fire, while others boiled their portions, the Roman shields being utilized as pans. "'What do you think of doing, Malchus?' Halco asked as they stretched themselves out on a grassy bank by the stream when they had finished their meal. "'We are safe here, and in these forests could defy the Romans to find us for months. Food we can get from the villages at the foot of the hills, and there must be many swine in the forest beside this herd which we have captured. The life would not be an unpleasant one, but—' And he stopped. "'But you don't wish to end your days here,' Malchus put in for him. "'Nor do I. It is pleasant enough, but every day we spend here is a waste of our lives.' and with Hannibal and our comrades combating the might of Rome, we cannot be content to live like members of the savage tribes here. I have no doubt that we shall excite such annoyance and alarm by our raids among the villages in the plains, that the Romans will ere long make a great effort to capture us, and doubtless they will enlist the natives in their search. Still, we may hope to escape them, and there are abundant points among these mountains where we may make a stand and inflict such heavy loss upon them that they will be glad to come to terms. All I would ask is that they shall swear by their gods to treat us well and to convey us as prisoners of war to Rome, there to remain until exchanged. In Rome we could await the course of events patiently. Hannibal may capture the city. The Senate, urged by relatives of the many prisoners we have taken, may agree to make an exchange, and we may see chances of our making our escape. At any rate, we shall be in the world, and I shall know what is going on. But could we not hold out and make them agree to give us our freedom? I do not think so, Malchus said. It would be too much for Roman pride to allow a handful of escaped prisoners to defy them in that way, and even if the prefect of this island were to agree to the terms, I do not believe that the Senate would ratify them. We had better not ask too much. For myself, I own to a longing to see Rome. As Carthage holds back and will send no aid to Hannibal, I have very little hope of ever entering it as a conqueror, and rather than not see it at all, I would not mind entering it as a prisoner. There are no mines to work there, and the Romans, with so vast a number of their own people in the hands of Hannibal, would not dare to treat us with any cruelty or severity. Here it is different. No rumor of our fate will ever reach Hannibal, and had every one of us died in those stifling mines, he would never have been the wiser. The two officers both agreed with Malchus. As for the soldiers, they were all too well pleased with their present liberty and their escape from the bondage to give a thought to the morrow. The next day Malchus and his companions explored the hills of the neighborhood and chose several points commanding the valleys by which their camp could be approached as lookout places. Trees were cleared away, vistas cut, and wood piled in readiness for making bonfires, and two sentries were placed at each of these posts, their orders being to keep a vigilant lookout all over the country, to light a fire instantly the approach of any enemy was perceived, and then to descend to the camp to give particulars as to his number and the direction of his march. A few days later, leaving ten men at the camp with full instructions as to what to do in case of an alarm by the enemy, Malchus set out with the rest of the party across the mountains. The sun was their only guide as to the direction of their course, and it was late in the afternoon before they reached the crest of the easternmost hills and looked down over the wide plain which divides the island into two portions. Here they rested until the next morning, and then, starting before daybreak, descended the slopes. They made their way to a village of some size at the mouth of a valley, and were unnoticed until they entered it. Most of the men were away in the fields. A few resisted, but were speedily beaten down by the short, heavy sticks which the Carthaginians carried in addition to their spears. Malchus had given strict orders that the latter weapons were not to be used, that no life was to be taken, and that no one was to be hurt or ill-used unless in the act of offering resistance. For a few minutes the confusion was great, women and children running about screaming in wild alarm. They were, however, pacified when they found that no harm was intended. On searching the village, large stores of grain were discovered, and an abundance of sacks were also found, and each soldier filled one of these with as much grain as he could conveniently carry. A number of other articles which would be useful to them were also taken, cooking pots, wooden platters, knives, and such arms as could be found. 
Laden with these, the Carthaginians set out on their return to camp. Loaded as they were, it was a long and toilsome journey, and they would have had great difficulty in finding their way back, had not Malchus taken the precaution of leaving four or five men at different points, with instructions to keep fires of damp wood burning, so that the smoke should act as a guide. It was, however, late on the second day after their leaving the village before they arrived in camp. Here the men set to work to crush the grain between flat stones, and soon a supply of rough cakes were baking in the embers. A month passed away. Similar raids to the first were made when the supplies became exhausted, and as at the second village they visited they captured six donkeys, which helped to carry up the burdens, the journeys were less fatiguing than on the first occasion. One morning as the troop were taking their breakfast, a column of bright smoke rose from one of the hilltops. The men simultaneously leaped to their feet. Finish your breakfast, Malchus said. There will be plenty of time. Slay two more hogs and cut them up. Let each man take three or four pounds of flesh and a supply of meal. Just as the preparations were concluded, the two men from the lookout arrived and reported that a large force was winding along one of the valleys. There were now but six of the herd of swine left. These were driven into the forest. The grain and other stores were also carried away and carefully hidden, and the band, who were now all well armed with weapons taken in the different raids in the villages, marched away from their camp. Malchus had already with his two comrades explored all the valleys in the neighborhood of the camp, and had fixed upon various points for defense. One of these was on the line by which the enemy was approaching. The valley narrowed in until it was almost closed by perpendicular rocks on either side. On the summit of these the Carthaginians took their post. They could now clearly make out the enemy. There were upwards of a thousand Roman troops, and they were accompanied by fully five hundred natives. When the head of the column approached the narrow path of the valley, the soldiers halted, and the natives went on ahead to reconnoiter. They reported that all seemed clear, and the column then moved forward. When it reached the gorge, a shout was heard above, and a shower of rocks fell from the crags, crushing many of the Romans. Their commander at once recalled the soldiers, and these then began to climb the hillside, wherever the ground permitted their doing so. After much labor they reached the crag from which they had been assailed, and found it deserted. All day the Romans searched the woods, but without success. The natives were sent forward in strong parties. Most of these returned unsuccessful, but two of them were suddenly attacked by the Carthaginians, and many were slaughtered. For four days the Romans pursued their search in the forest, but never once did they obtain a glimpse of the Carthaginians, save when, on several occasions, the latter appeared suddenly in places inaccessible from below and hurled down rocks and stones upon them. The Sars had been attacked several times, and were so disheartened by the loss inflicted upon them that they now refused to stir into the woods unless accompanied by the Romans. At the end of the fourth day, feeling it hopeless any longer to pursue the fugitive band over these forest-covered mountains, the Roman commander ordered the column to move back towards its starting place. He had lost between forty and fifty of his men, and upwards of a hundred of the Sards had been killed. Just as he reached the edge of the forest, he was overtaken by one of the natives. "'I have been a prisoner in the hands of the Carthaginians,' the man said, "'and their leader released me upon my taking an oath to deliver a message to the general.' The man was at once brought before the officer. "'The leader of the escaped slaves bids me tell you,' he said, "'that had you ten times as many men with you, it would be vain for you to attempt to capture them. You searched, in these four days, but a few square miles of the forest, and, although he was never a half mile away from you, you did not succeed in capturing him. There are hundreds of square miles, and, did he choose to elude you, twenty thousand men might search in vain. He bids me say that he could hold out for years and harry all the villages of the plains, but he and his men do not care for living the life of a mountain tribe, and he is ready to discuss terms of surrender with you, and will meet you outside the forest here with two men with him, if you on your part will be here with the same number at noon to-morrow. He took before me a solemn oath that he will keep the truce inviolate, and requires you to do the same. I have promised to take back your answer. The Roman commander was greatly vexed at his non-success, and at the long-continued trouble which he saw would rise from the presence of this determined band in the mountains. They would probably be joined by some of the recently subdued tribes, and would be a thorn in the side of the Roman force holding the island. He was, therefore, much relieved by this unexpected proposal. Return to him who sent you, he said, and tell him that I, Publius Manlius, commander of that portion of the Tenth Legion here, do hereby swear before the gods that I will hold the truce inviolate, and that I will meet him here with two officers, as he proposes, at noon to-morrow. At the appointed hour, Malchus, with the two officers, standing just inside the edge of the forest, saw the Roman general advancing with two companions. They at once went forward to meet them. I am come, Malchus said to offer to surrender to you on certain terms. 
I gave you my reasons in the message I yesterday sent you. With my band here I could defy your attempts to capture me for years, but I do not care to lead the life of a mountain robber. Hannibal treats his captives mercifully, and the treatment which was bestowed upon me and my companions, who were not even taken in a fair fight, but were blown by a tempest into your port, was a disgrace to Rome. My demand is this, that we shall be treated with the respect due to brave men, that we would be allowed to march without guard or escort down to the port, where we will go straight on board a vessel there prepared for us. We will then lay down our arms and surrender as prisoners of war, under the solemn agreement taken and signed by you and the governor of the island, and approved and ratified by the Senate of Rome, that, in the first place, the garments and armor of which we were deprived when captured shall be restored to us, and that we shall then be conveyed in the ship to Rome, there to remain as prisoners of war until exchanged, being sent nowhere else, and suffering no pains or penalties whatever for what has taken place on this island. The Roman general was surprised and pleased with the moderation of the demand. He had feared that Malchus would have insisted upon being restored with his companions to the Carthaginian army in Italy. Such a proposition he would have been unwilling to forward to Rome, for it would have been a confession that all the Roman force in the island was incapable of overcoming this handful of desperate men, and he did not think the demand, if made, would have been agreed to by the Senate. The present proposition was vastly more acceptable. He could report without humiliation that the Carthaginian slaves had broken loose and taken to the mountains, where there would be great difficulty in pursuing them, and they would serve as a nucleus round which would assemble all the disaffected in the island, and could recommend that, as they only demanded to be sent to Rome as prisoners of war, instead of being kept in the island, the terms should be agreed to. After a moment's delay, therefore, he replied, I agree to your terms, sir, as far as I am concerned, and own they appear to me as moderate and reasonable. I will draw out a document, setting them forth, and my acceptance of them, and will send it at once to the prefect, praying him to sign it, and to forward it to Rome for the approval of the Senate. Pending an answer, I trust that you will abstain from any further attacks upon the villages. It may be a fortnight before the answer returns, Malchus replied, but if you will send up to this point a supply of cattle and flour sufficient for our wants till an answer comes, I will promise to abstain from all further action. To this the Roman readily agreed, and for a fortnight Malchus and his friends amused themselves by hunting deer and wild boar among the mountains. After a week had passed, a man had been sent each day to the spot agreed upon to see if any answer had been received from Rome. It was nearly three weeks before he brought a message to Malchus that the terms had been accepted, and that the Roman commander would meet him there on the following day with the document. The interview took place, as arranged, and the Roman handed to Malchus the document agreeing to the terms proposed, signed by himself and the prefect, and ratified by the Senate. He said that if Malchus with his party would descend into the road on the following morning, three miles below Metella, they would find an escort of Roman soldiers awaiting them, and that a vessel would be ready at the port for them to embark upon their arrival. Next day, accordingly, Malchus with his companions left the forest and marched down to the valley in military order. At the appointed spot they found twenty Roman soldiers under an officer. The latter saluted Malchus and informed him that his orders were to escort them to the port, and to see that they suffered no molestation or interference at the hands of the natives on their march. Two days' journey took them to Carolus, and in good order and with proud bearing they marched through the Roman soldiers, who assembled in the streets to view so strange a spectacle. Arrived at the port, they embarked on board the ship prepared for them, and there piled their arms on deck. A Roman officer received them, and handed over, in accordance with the terms of the agreement, the whole of the clothing and armor of which they had been deprived. A guard of soldiers then marched on board, and an hour later the sails were hoisted, and the vessel started for her destination. Anxiously Malchus and his companions gazed round the horizon in hopes that some galleys of Capua or Carthage might appear in sight, although indeed they had but small hopes of seeing them, for no Carthaginian ship would likely to be found so near the coast of Italy, except indeed if bound with arms for the use of the insurgents in the northern mountains of Sardinia. However, no sail appeared in sight until the ship entered the mouth of the Tiber. As they ascended the river, and the walls and towers of Rome were seen in the distance, the prisoners forgot their own position in the interest excited by the appearance of the great rival of Carthage. At that time, Rome possessed but little of the magnificence which distinguished her buildings in the day of the emperors. Everything was massive and plain, with but slight attempt at architectural adornment. The temples of the gods rose in stately majesty above the mass of buildings, but even these were far inferior in size and beauty to those of Carthage, while the size of the city was small indeed in comparison to the wide spreading extent of its African rival. The vessel anchored in the stream until the officer in command landed to report his arrival with the prisoners and to receive instructions. An hour later he returned, 
Prisoners were landed and received by a strong guard of spearmen at the water gate. The news had spread rapidly through the city. A crowd of people thronged the streets, while at the windows and on the roofs were gathered numbers of ladies of upper classes. A party of soldiers led the way, pushing back the crowd as they advanced. A line of spearmen marched on either side of the captives, and a strong guard brought up the rear to prevent the crowd from pressing in there. Malchus walked at the head of the prisoners, followed by his officers, after whom came the soldiers, walking two and two. There was no air of dejection in the bearing of the captives, and they faced the regards of the hostile crowd with the air rather of conquerors than of prisoners. They remembered that it was but by accident that they had fallen into the hands of the Romans, that in the battlefield they had proved themselves over and over again more than a match for the soldiers of Rome, and that it was the walls of the city alone which had prevented their marching through her streets as triumphant conquerors. It was no novel sight in Rome for Carthaginian prisoners to march through the streets, for in the previous campaigns large numbers of Carthaginians had been captured. But since Hannibal crossed the Alps and carried his victorious army through Italy, scarce a prisoner had been brought to Rome, while tens of thousands of Romans had fallen into the hands of Hannibal. The lower class of the population of Rome were at all times rough and brutal, and the captives were assailed with shouts of exultation, with groans and menaces, and with bitter curses by those whose friends and relatives had fallen in the wars. The better classes at the windows and from the housetops abstained from any demonstration, but watched the captives as they passed with a critical eye and with expressions of admiration at their fearless bearing and haughty mien. Truly that youth who marches at their head might pose for a Carthaginian Apollo, Sopronius, a Roman matron said as she sat at the balcony of a large mansion at the entrance to the forum. I have seldom seen a finer face. See what strength his limbs show, although he walks as lightly as a girl. I have a fancy to have him as a slave. He would look well to walk behind me and carry my mantle when I go abroad. See to it, Sempronius. As your father is the military praetor, you can manage this for me without trouble. I will do my best, Lady Flavia, the young Roman said, but there may be difficulties. What difficulties? Flavia demanded imperiously. I suppose the Carthaginians will, as usual, be handed over as slaves, and who should have a better right to choose one among them than I, whose husband, Tiberius Gracchus, is consul of Rome? None assuredly, Sempronius replied. It was only because, as I hear, that youth is a cousin of Hannibal himself, and, young as he is, the captain of his bodyguard, and I thought that my father might intend to confine him in the prison for better security. Flavia waved her hand imperiously. When did you ever hear of a slave escaping from Rome, Sopronius? Are not the walls high and strong, and the sentries numerous? And even did they pass these, would not the badge of slavery betray them at once to the first who met them without, and they would be captured and brought back? No, I have set my mind upon having him as a slave. He will go well with that Gaulish maiden whom Posthumus sent me from the banks of the Po last autumn. I like my slaves to be as handsome as my other surroundings, and I see no reason why I should be balked of my fancy. I will do my best to carry out your wishes, Lady Flavia, Sopronius replied deferentially, for the wife of the council was an important personage in Rome. Her family was one of the most noble and powerful in the city, and she herself, wealthy, luxurious, and strong-willed, was regarded as a leader of society at Rome. Sopronius deemed it essential for his future advancement to keep on good terms with her. At the same time, he was ill-pleased at this last fancy of hers. In the first place, he was a suitor for the hand of her daughter, Julia. In the second, he greatly admired the northern beauty of the Gaulish slave-girl whom she had spoken of, and had fully intended that when Flavia became tired of her, and her fancies seldom lasted long, he would get his mother to offer to exchange a horse, or a hawk, or something else upon which Flavia might set her mind, for the slave-girl, in which case she would, of course, be in his power. He did not, therefore, approve of Flavia's intention of introducing this handsome young Carthaginian as a slave into her household. It was true that he was but a slave at present, but he was a Carthaginian noble of rank as high as that of Flavia. That he was brave was certain, or he would not be the captain of Hannibal's bodyguard. Julia was fully as capricious as her mother, and might take as warm a fancy for Malchus as Flavia had done. While now the idea of setting this Gaulish girl and the Carthaginian together had seized Flavia, it would render more distant the time when the Roman lady might reasonably be expected to tire of the girl. However, he felt that Flavia's wishes must be carried out. Whatever the danger might be, it was less serious than the certainty of losing that lady's favor unless he humored her whims. His family was far less distinguished than hers, and her approval of his suit with Julia was an unexpected piece of good fortune which he owed, as he knew, principally to the fact that Gracchus wished to marry his daughter to Julius Marcius, who had deeply offended Flavia by an outspoken expression of opinion, 
that Roman ladies mingled too much in public affairs, and that they ought to be content to stay at home and rule their households and slaves. He knew that he would have no difficulty with his father. The praetor was most anxious that his son should make an alliance with the house of Gracchus, and it was the custom that such prisoners taken in war, as were not sacrificed to the gods, should be given as slaves to the nobles. As yet the great contest in the arena, which cost the lives of such vast numbers of prisoners taken in war, were not instituted. Occasional combats, indeed, took place, but these were on a small scale, and were regarded rather as a sacrifice to Mars than as an amusement for the people. Sempronius accordingly took his way moodily home. The praetor had just returned, having seen Malchus and the officers lodged in prison, while the men were set to work on the fortifications. Sempronius stated Flavia's request. The praetor looked doubtful. I had intended, he said, to have kept the officers in prison until the Senate decided what should be done with them. But, of course, if Flavia has set her mind on it, I must strain a point. After all, there is no special reason why the prisoners should be treated differently to others. Of course, I cannot send the leader of the party to Flavia and let the others remain in prison. As there are two of them, I will send them as presents to two of the principal families in Rome, so that if any question arises upon the subject, I shall at once have powerful defenders. At any rate, it will not do to offend Flavia. Malchus, as he was led through the streets of Rome, had been making comparisons by no means to the favor of Carthage. The greater simplicity of dress, the absence of the luxury which was so unbridled at Carthage, the plainness of the architecture of the houses, the free and manly bearing of the citizens, all impressed him. Rough as was the crowd who jeered and hooted him and his companions, there was a power and a vigor among them which was altogether lacking at home. Under the influence of excitement, the populace there was capable of rising and asserting themselves, but their general demeanor was that of subservience to the wealthy and powerful. The tyranny of the Senate weighed on the people. The numerous secret denunciations and arrests inspired each man with a mistrust of his neighbor, for none could say that he was safe from the action of secret enemies. The Romans, on the other hand, were no respecter of persons. Every free citizen deemed himself the equal of the best. The plebeians held their own against the patricians, and could always return one of the consuls, generally selecting the man who had most distinguished himself by his hostility to the patricians. The tribunes, whose power in Rome was nearly equal to that of the consuls, were almost always the representatives and champions of the plebeians, and their power balanced that of the Senate, which was entirely in the interest of the aristocracy. Malchus was reflecting over these things in the prison when the door of his cell opened, and Sopronius, accompanied by two soldiers, entered. The former addressed him in Greek. Follow me, he said. You have been appointed by my father, the praetor Caius, to be the domestic slave of the lady Flavia Gracchus, until such time as the Senate may determine upon your fate. As Carthage also enslaved prisoners taken in war, Malchus showed no surprise, although he would have preferred laboring upon the fortifications with his men to domestic slavery, however light the latter might be. Without a comment, then, he rose and accompanied Sempronius from his prison. Domestic slavery in Rome was not as a whole a severe fate. The masters, indeed, had the power of life and death over their slaves. They could flog and ill-use them as they chose, but as a rule they treated them well and kindly. The Romans were essentially a domestic people, kind to their wives and affectionate, although sometimes strict with their children. The slaves were treated as the other servants, and indeed, with scarce an exception, all servants were slaves. The rule was easy and the labor by no means hard. Favorite slaves were raised to positions of trust and confidence, they frequently amassed considerable sums of money and were often granted their freedom after faithful services. End of chapter 20. Recording by Brett Downey. Chapter 21 of The Young Carthaginian. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Brett Downey. The Young Carthaginian, A Story of the Times of Hannibal, by George Alfred Henty. Chapter 21. The Gaulish Slave. On arriving at the mansion of Gracchus, Sempronius led Malchus to the apartment occupied by Flavia. Her face lighted with satisfaction. You have done well, my Sempronius, she said. I shall not forget your ready gratification of my wish. So this is the young Carthaginian. My friends will all envy me at having so handsome a youth to attend upon me. Do you speak our tongue? she asked graciously. A few words only, Malchus answered. I speak Greek. It is tiresome, Flavia said, addressing Sempronius, that I do not know that language. But Julia has been taught it. 
tell him sopronius that his duties will be easy he will accompany me when i walk abroad and will stand behind me at table and will have charge of my pets the young lion cub that tiberius procured for me is getting troublesome and needs a firm hand over him he nearly killed one of the slaves yesterday sempronius translated flavius speech to malchus i shall dress him flavia said in white and gold he will look charming in it it is hardly the dress for a slave sempronius ventured to object i suppose i can dress him as i please lesbia the wife of emilius dresses her household slaves in blue and silver and i suppose i have as much right as she has to indulge my fancies certainly lady flavia sempronius said reverentially i only thought that such favors shown to the carthaginian might make the other slaves jealous flavia made no answer but waved her fan to sempronius in token of dismissal the young roman inwardly cursing her haughty airs took his leave at once and flavia handed malchus over to the charge of the chief of the household with strict directions as to the dress which was to be obtained for him and with orders to give the animals into his charge malchus followed the man congratulating himself that if he must serve as a slave at least he could hardly have found an easier situation the pets consisted of some bright birds from the east a persian greyhound several cats a young bear and a half-grown lion of these the lion alone was fastened up in consequence of his attack upon the slave of the previous day malchus was fond of animals and at once advanced boldly to the lion animal crouched as if for a spring but the steady gaze of malchus speedily changed its intention and advancing to the full length of its chain it rubbed itself against him like a great cat malchus stroked its side and then going to a fountain filled a flat vessel with water and placed it before it the lion lapped the water eagerly since its assault upon the slave who usually attended to it none of the others had ventured to approach it they had indeed thrown it food but had neglected to supply it with water we shall get on well together old fellow malchus said we are both african captives and ought to be friends finding from the other slaves that until the previous day the animal had been accustomed to run about the house freely and to lie in flavia's room malchus at once unfastened the chain and for some time played with the lion which appeared gentle and good-tempered as the master of the household soon informed the others of the orders he had received respecting malchus the slaves saw that the newcomer was likely for a time at least to stand very high in the favor of their capricious mistress and therefore strove in every way to gain his good will presently malchus was sent for again and found julia sitting on the couch by the side of her mother and he at once acknowledged to himself that he had seldom seen a fairer woman she was tall and her figure was full and well proportioned her glossy hair was wound in a coil at the back of her head and her neck and arms were bare and she wore a garment of light green silk and embroidered with gold stripes along the bottom reaching down to her knees while beneath it a petticoat of tyrian purple reached nearly to the ground is he not good-looking julia flavia asked there is not a slave in rome like him lesbia and fulvia will be green with envy julia made no reply but sat examining the face of malchus with as much composure as if he had been a statue he had bowed on entering as he would have done in the presence of carthaginian ladies and now stood composedly awaiting flavia's orders ask him julia if it is true that he is a cousin of hannibal and the captain of his guard such a youth as he is i can hardly believe it and yet how strong and sinewy are his limbs and he has an air of command in his face he interests me this slave julia asked in greek the questions that her mother had dictated ask him now julia flavia said when her daughter had translated the answer how he came to be captured malchus recounted the story of his being blown by a gale into the roman ports then on her own account julia inquired whether he had been present at the various battles of the campaign after an hour's conversation malchus was dismissed and passing through the hall beyond he came suddenly upon a female who issued from one of the female apartments they gave a simultaneous cry of astonishment clotilde malchus exclaimed you here and a captive alas yes the girl replied i was brought here three months since i have heard nothing of you all malchus said since your father returned with his contingent after the battle of trasimene we knew that posthumus with his legion was harrying cisalpine gaul but no particular has reached us my father is slain the girl said he and the tribe were defeated the next day the romans attacked the village we the women and the old men defended it till the last my two sisters were killed i was taken prisoner and sent hither as a present to flavia by posthumus i have been wishing to die but now since you are here i shall be content to live even as a roman slave while they were speaking they had been standing with their hands clasped malchus looking down into her face 
over which the tears were now streaming as she recalled the sad events at home, wondered at the change which eighteen months had wrought in it. Then she was a girl, now she was a beautiful woman, the fairest he had ever seen, Malchus thought, with her light brown hair, with a gleam of gold, her deep gray eyes, and tender, sensitive mouth. And your mother? he asked. She was with my father in the battle, and was left for dead on the field. But I heard from a captive, taken a month after I was, that she had survived, and was with the remnant of the tribe in the well-nigh inaccessible fastnesses at the head of the Orcus. We had best meet as strangers, Malchus said. It were well that none suspect we have met before. I shall not stay here long, if I am not exchanged. I shall try to escape, whatever be the risks, and if you will accompany me, I will not go alone. You know I will, Malchus, Clotilde answered frankly. Whenever you give the word, I am ready, whatever the risk is. It should break my heart were I left here alone again. A footstep was heard approaching, and Clotilde, dropping Malchus's hands, fled away into the inner apartments, while Malchus walked quietly on to the part of the house appropriated to the slaves. The next day, having assumed his new garments, and having had a light gold ring, as a badge of servitude, fastened round his neck, Malchus accompanied Flavia and her daughter on a series of visits to their friends. The meeting with Clotilde had delighted as much as it had surprised Malchus. The figure of the Gaulish maiden had been often before his eyes during his long night watches. When he was with her last, he had resolved that when he had next journeyed north, he would ask her hand of the chief, and since his journey to Carthage, his thoughts had still more often reverted to her. The loathing which he now felt for Carthage had converted what was, when he was staying with Alabrigius, little more than an idea, into a fixed determination that he would cut himself loose altogether from corrupt and degenerate Carthage, and settle among the Gauls, that he should find Clotilde, captive in Rome, had never entered his wildest imagination, and he now blessed, as a piece of the greatest good fortune, the chance which had thrown him into the hands of the Romans, and brought him into the very house where Clotilde was a slave. Had it not been for that, he would never again have heard of her. When he returned to her ruined home, he would have found that she had been carried away by the Roman conquerors, but of her after-fate no word could ever have reached him. Some weeks passed, but no mode of escape presented itself to his mind. Occasionally, for a few moments, he saw Clotilde alone, and they were often together in Flavia's apartment, for the Roman lady was proud of showing off to her friends her two slaves, both models of their respective races. Julia had at first been cold and hard to Malchus, but gradually her manner had changed, and she now spoke kindly and condescendingly to him, and would sometimes sit looking at him from under her dark eyebrows with an expression which Malchus altogether failed to interpret. Clotilde was more clear-sighted. One day, meeting Malchus alone in the atrium, she said to him, Malchus, do you know that I fear Julia is learning to love you? I see it in her face, in the glance of her eye, in the softening of that full mouth of hers. You are dreaming, little Clotilde, Malchus said, laughing. I am not, she said firmly. I tell you, she loves you. Impossible, Malchus said incredulously. The haughty Julia, the fairest of the Roman maidens, fall in love with a slave? You are dreaming, Clotilde. But you are not a common slave, Malchus. You are a Carthaginian noble, and the cousin of Hannibal. You are her equal in all respects. Save for this gold collar, Malchus said, touching the badge of slavery lightly. Are you sure you do not love her in return, Malchus? She is very beautiful. Is she? Malchus said carelessly. Were she fifty times more beautiful, it would make no difference to me, for, as you know as well as I do, I love someone else. Clotilde flushed to the brow. You have never said so, she said softly. What occasion to say so when you know it? You have always known it, ever since the day when we went over the bridge together. But I am no fit mate for you, she said, even when my father was alive and the tribe unbroken. What were we that I should wed a great Carthaginian noble? Now the tribe is broken. I am only a Roman slave. Have you anything else to observe? Malchus said quietly. Yes, a great deal more, she went on urgently. How could you present your wife, an ignorant Gaulish girl, to your relatives, the haughty dames of Carthage? They would look down upon me and despise me. Clotilde, you are betraying yourself, Malchus said, smiling, for you have evidently thought the matter over in every light. No, he said, detaining her, as, with an exclamation of shame, she would have fled away. You must not go. You knew that I loved you, and for every time you have thought of me, be it ever so often, I have thought of you a score. You knew that I loved you, and intended to ask your hand from your father. As for the dames of Carthage, I think not of carrying you there, but if you will wed me, I will settle down for life among your people. A footstep was heard approaching. Malchus pressed Clotilde for a moment against his breast, and then he was alone. The newcomer was Sempronius. 
He was still a frequent visitor, but he was conscious that he had lately lost rather than gained ground in the good graces of Julia. Averse as he had been from the first to the introduction of Malchus into the household, he was not long in discovering the reason for the change in Julia, and the dislike he had from the first felt of Malchus had deepened into a feeling of bitter hatred. Slave, he said haughtily, tell your mistress that I am here. I am not your slave, Malchus said calmly, and shall not obey your orders when addressed in such a tone. Insolent hound! the young Roman exclaimed. I will chastise you. And he struck Malchus with his stick. In an instant the latter sprang upon him, struck him to the ground, and wrenching the staff from his hand, laid it heavily across him. At that moment Flavia, followed by her daughter, hurried in at the sound of the struggle. Malchus! she exclaimed. What means this? It means, Sempronius said, rising livid with passion, that your slave has struck me, me, a Roman patrician. I will lodge a complaint against him, and the penalty you know is death he struck me first lady flavia malchus said quietly because i would not do his behests when he spoke to me as a dog if you struck my slave sempronius flavia said coldly i blame him not that he returned the blow although a prisoner of war he is as you well know of a rank in carthage superior to your own and i wonder not that if you struck him he struck you in return you know that you had no right to touch my slave and if you now take any steps against him I warn you that you will never enter this house again. Nor will I ever speak a word to you, Julia added. But he has struck me, Sempronius said furiously. He has knocked me down and beaten me. Apparently you brought it upon yourself, Flavia said. None but ourselves know what has happened. Therefore, neither shame nor disgrace can arise from it. My advice to you is, go home now and remain there until those marks of the stick have died out. It will be easy for you to assign an excuse. If you follow the matter up, I will proclaim among my friends how I found you here groveling on the ground while you were beaten. What will then be said of your manliness? Already the repeated excuses which have served you from abstaining to join the armies in the field have been a matter for much comment. You best know whether it would improve your position were it known that you had been beaten by a slave. Why, you would be a jest among young Romans. Sempronius stood irresolute. His last hopes of winning Julia were annihilated by what had happened. The tone of contempt in which both mother and daughter had spoken sufficiently indicated their feelings, and for a moment he hesitated whether he would not take what revenge he could by denouncing Malchus. But the thought was speedily put aside. He had been wrong in striking the domestic slave of another, but the fact that Malchus had been first attacked, and the whole influence of the house of Gracchus, its relations, friends, and clients exerted in his behalf, would hardly suffice to save him. Still, the revenge would be bought dearly in the future hostility of Flavia and her friends, and in the exposure of his own humiliating attitude. He therefore, with a great effort, subdued all signs of anger, and said, Lady Flavia, your wish has always been law to me, and I would rather than anything should happen than that I should lose your favor and patronage. Therefore I am willing to forget what has happened, and the more so as I own that I acted wrongly in striking your slave. I trust that after this apology you will continue to be the kindly friend that I have always found you. Certainly, Sempronius, Flavia said graciously, and I shall not forget your ready acquiescence in my wishes. It was the more easy for Sempronius to yield, inasmuch as Malchus had, after stating that he had been struck first, quietly left the apartment. For some little time things went on as before. Malchus was now at home in Rome, as a slave of one of the most powerful families, as was indicated by the badge he wore on his dress. He was able, when his services were not required, to wander at will in the city. He made the circuit of the walls, marked the spots which were least frequented, and where an escape would be most easily made. And having selected a spot most remote from the busy quarter of the town, he purchased a long rope, and carrying it there, concealed it under some stones close to one of the flights of steps by which access was obtained to the summit of the wall. The difficulty was not now how to escape from Rome, for that, now that he had so much freedom of movement, was easy, but how to proceed when he had once gained the open country, for himself he had little doubt that he should be able to make his way through the territories of the allies of Rome. But the difficulty of travelling with Clotilde would be much greater. Clotilde, he said one day, set your wits to work and try to think of some disguise in which you might pass with me. I have already prepared for getting beyond the walls, but the pursuit after us will be hot, and until we reach the Carthaginian lines every man's hand will be against us. I have thought of it, Malchus. The only thing that I can see is for me to stain my skin and dye my hair and go as a peasant boy. That is what I, too, have thought of, Clotilde. The disguise would be a poor one, for the roundness of your arms and the color of your eyes would betray you at once 
to any one who looked closely at you. However, as I can see no better way, I will get thee garments, and some for myself to match, and some stuff for staining the skin and hair. The next day Malchus bought the clothes and dye, and managed to bring them into the household unobserved, and to give to Clotilde those intended for her. The lion, under the influence of the mingled firmness and kindness of Malchus, had now recovered his docility, and followed him about the house like a great dog, sleeping stretched out on a mat by the side of his couch. Sempronius continued his visits. Malchus was seldom present when he was with Flavia, but Clotilde was generally in the room. It was now the height of summer, and her duty was to stand behind her mistress with a large fan, with which she kept up a gentle current of air over Flavia's head, and drove off the troublesome flies. Sometimes she had to continue doing so for hours while Flavia chatted with her friends. Sempronius was biding his time. The two slaves were still high in Flavia's favor, but he was in hopes that something might occur which would render her willing to part with them. He watched Julia narrowly whenever Malchus entered the room, and became more and more convinced that she had taken a strong fancy for the Carthaginian slave, and the idea occurred to him that by exciting her jealousy he might succeed in obtaining his object. So careful were Malchus and Clotilde that he had no idea whatever that any understanding existed between them. This, however, mattered but little. Nothing was more likely than that these two handsome slaves should fall in love with each other, and he determined to suggest the idea to Julia. Accordingly, one day, when he was sitting beside her, while Flavia was talking with some other visitors, he remarked carelessly, Your mother's two slaves, the Carthaginian and the Gaul, would make a handsome couple. He saw a flush of anger in Julia's face. For a moment she did not reply, and then said in a tone of indifference, Yes, they are each well favored in their way. Methinks the idea has occurred to them, Sempronius said. I have seen them glance at each other, and doubt not that when beyond your presence they do not confine themselves to looks. Julia was silent but Sempronius saw in the tightly compressed lips and the lowering brow with which she looked from one to the other that the shaft had told. I have wondered sometimes, he said, in an idle moment, whether they ever met before. The Carthaginians were, for some time, among the Cisalpine Gauls, and the girl was, you have told me, the daughter of a chief there. They may well have met. Julia made no reply, and Sempronius, feeling that he had said enough, began to talk on other subjects. Julia scarcely answered him, and at last impatiently waved him away. She sat silent and abstracted until the last of the visitors had left. Then she rose from her seat and walked quietly up to her mother and said abruptly to Clotilde, who was standing behind her mistress, Did you know the slave Malchus before you met here? The suddenness of the question sent the blood up into the cheeks of the Gaulish maiden, and Julia felt at once that the hints of Sempronius were fully justified. Yes, Clotilde answered quietly. I met him when, with Hannibal, he came down from the Alps into our country. "'Why did you not say so before?' Julia asked passionately. "'Mother, the slaves have been deceiving us.' "'Julia,' Flavia said in surprise, "'why this heat? What matters it to us whether they have met before?' Julia did not pay any attention, but stood with angry eyes waiting for Clotilde's answer. "'I did not know, Lady Julia,' the girl said quietly, "'that the affairs of your slaves were of any interest to you. We recognized each other when we first met. Long ago now, when we were both in a different position.' "'And when you loved each other?' Julia said in a tone of concentrated passion. "'And when we loved each other,' Clotilde repeated, her head thrown back now, and her bearing as proud and haughty as that of Julia. "'You hear that, mother? You hear this comedy that these slaves have been playing under your nose? Send them both to the whipping-post.' "'My dear Julia,' Flavia exclaimed, more and more surprised at her anger. "'What harm has been done? You astonish me. Clotilde, you can retire. "'What means all this, Julia?' She went on more severely when they were alone. Why all this strange passion because two slaves, who by some chance have met each other before, are lovers? What is this Gaulish girl, and what is this Carthaginian slave to you? I love him, mother, Julia said passionately. You? Flavia exclaimed in angry surprise. You, Julia, of the house of Gracchus, love a slave? You are mad, girl, and shameless. I say so without shame, Julia replied. And why should I not? He is a noble of Carthage, though now a prisoner of war. What if my father is a consul? Malchus is the cousin of Hannibal, who is a greater man than Rome has ever yet seen. Why should I not wed him? In the first place, it seems, Julia, Flavia said gravely, because he loves someone else. In the second place, because, as I hear, he is likely to be exchanged very shortly for a praetor taken prisoner at Cannae, and will soon be fighting against us. In the third place, because all Rome would be scandalized were a Roman maiden of the patrician order, and of the house of Gracchus, to marry one of the invaders of her country. Go to, Julia. 
I blush for you. So this is the reason why of late you have behaved so coldly to Sopronius. Shame on you, daughter. What would your father say, did he, on his return from the field, hear of your doings? Go to your chamber, and do not let me see you again, till you can tell me that you have purged this madness from your veins. Without a word, Julia turned and left the room. Parental discipline was strong in Rome, and none dared disobey a parent's command, and although Julia had far more liberty and license than most unmarried Roman girls, she did not dare to answer her mother when she spoke in such a tone. Flavia sat for some time in thought. Then she sent for Malchus. He had already exchanged a few words with Clotilde, and was therefore prepared for her questions. Malchus, is it true that you love my Gaulish slave girl? It is true, Malchus replied quietly. When we met in Gaul two years since, she was the daughter of a chief, I a noble of Carthage. I loved her, but we were both young, and with so great a war in hand, it was not a time to speak of marriage. Would you marry her now? Not as a slave, Malchus replied. When I marry her, it shall be before the face of all men, I as a noble of Carthage, and she as a noble Gaulish maiden. Hannibal is treating for your exchange now, Flavia said. There are difficulties in the way, for, as you know, the Senate have refused to allow its citizens who surrender to be ransomed or exchanged. But the friends of the praetor, Publius, are powerful and are bringing all their influence to bear to obtain the exchange of their kinsmen, whom Hannibal has offered for you. I will gladly use what influence I and my family possess to aid them. I knew when you came to me that, as a prisoner of war, it was likely that you might be exchanged. You have been very kind, my lady Flavia, Malchus said, and I esteem myself most fortunate in having fallen into such hands. Since you know now how it is, with me and Clotilde, I can ask you at once to let me ransom her of you. Any sum that you like to name, I will bind myself, on my return to the Carthaginian camp, to pay for her. I will think it over, Flavia said graciously. Clotilde is useful to me, but I can dispense with her services, and will ask you no exorbitant amount for her. If the negotiations for exchange come to aught, you may rely upon it that she shall go hence with you. With an expression of deep gratitude, Malchus retired. Flavia, in thus acceding to the wishes of Malchus, was influenced by several motives. She was sincerely shocked at Julia's conduct, and was most desirous of getting both Malchus and Clotilde away, for she knew that her daughter was headstrong as she was passionate, and the presence of Clotilde in the house would, even were Malchus absent, be a source of strife and bitterness between herself and her daughter. In the second place, it would be a pretty story to tell her friends, and she should be able to take credit to herself for her magnanimity in parting with her favorite attendant. Lastly, in the present state of affairs, it might possibly happen that it would be of no slight advantage to have a friend possessed of great power and influence in the Carthaginian camp. Her husband might be captured in fight. It was not beyond the bounds of possibility that Rome itself might fall into the hands of the Carthaginians. It was, therefore, well worth while making a friend of a man who was a near relation of Hannibal. For some days Julia kept her own apartment. All the household knew that something had gone wrong, though none were aware of the cause. A general feeling of uneasiness existed, for Julia had from a child in her fits of temper been harsh with her slaves, venting her temper by cruelly beating and pinching them. Many a slave had been flogged by her orders at such a time, for her mother, although herself an easy mistress, seldom interfered with her caprices, and all that she did was good in the eyes of her father. At the end of the week Flavia told Malchus that the negotiations for his release had been broken off, the Roman Senate remaining inflexible in the resolve that Romans who surrendered to the enemy should not be exchanged. Malchus was much disappointed, as it had seemed that the time of his release was near. However, he had still his former plan of escape to fall back upon. A day or two later Julia sent a slave with a message to Sempronius, and in the afternoon sallied out with a confidential attendant, who always accompanied her when she went abroad. In the forum she met Sempronius, who saluted her. Sempronius, she said, coming at once to the purpose, Will you do me a favor? I would do anything to oblige you, Lady Julia, as you know. That is the language of courtesy, Julia said shortly. I mean, would you be ready to run some risk? Certainly, Sempronius answered readily. You will do it the more readily, perhaps, Julia said, inasmuch as it will gratify your revenge. You have reason to hate Malchus, the Carthaginian slave. Sempronius nodded. Your suspicion was true. He loves the Gaulish slave. They have been questioned and have confessed it. I want them separated. But how? Sempronius asked, rejoicing inwardly at finding that Julia's wishes agreed so nearly with his own. I want her carried off, Julia said shortly. When once you have got her, you can do with her as you will. Make her your slave, kill her, do as you like with her. That is nothing to me. All I want is that she shall go. 
I suppose you have some place where you can take her. Yes, Sempronius said. I have a small estate among the Alban Hills, where she would be safe enough from searchers. But how to get her there? She never goes out except with Lady Flavia. She must be taken from the house, Julia said shortly. Pretty slaves have been carried off before now, and no suspicion need light upon you. You might find some place in the city to hide her for a few days, and then boldly carry her through the gates in a litter. None will think of questioning you. The wrath of the Lady Flavia would be terrible, Sempronius said doubtfully. My mother would be furious at first, Julia said coldly. But get her a new plaything, a monkey, or a Numidian slave boy, and she will soon forget all about the matter. But how do you propose it should be done? Sempronius asked. My slave shall withdraw all the bolts of the back entrance to the house, Julia said. Do you be there at two in the morning, when all will be sound asleep. Bring with you a couple of barefooted slaves. My woman will be at the door and will guide you to the chamber where the girl sleeps. You have only to gag her and carry her quietly off. Sempronius stood for a moment in doubt. The enterprise was certainly feasible. Wild adventures of this kind were not uncommon among the dissolute young Romans, and Sempronius saw at once that were he detected, Julia's influence would prevent her mother from taking the matter up hotly. Julia guessed his thoughts. If you are found out, she said, I will take the blame upon myself and tell my mother that you are acting solely at my request. I will do it, Julia, he agreed. Tonight at two o'clock. I will be at the back door with two slaves whom I can trust. I will have a place prepared to which I can take the girl till it is safe to carry her from the city. End of chapter 21 Recording by Brett Downey Chapter 22 of The Young Carthaginian This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriDox.org. Recording by Ravi Shankar The Young Carthaginian A Story of the Times of Hannibal by George Alfred Henty Chapter 22 The Lion Malchus was sleeping soundly that night when he was awakened by a low, angry sound from the lion. He looked up and saw by the faint light of a lamp which burned in the hall from which the niche-like bedchambers of the principal slaves opened, that the animal had risen to its feet. Knowing that, docile as it was, with those it knew, the lion objected to strangers, the thought occurred to him that some midnight thief had entered the house for the purpose of robbery. Malchus took his staff and sallied out, the lion walking beside him. He traversed the hall and went from room to room until he entered the portion of the house inhabited by Flavia and the female slaves. Here he would have hesitated, but the lion continued its way, crouching as it walked, and its tail beating its sides with short, quick strokes. There was no one in the principal apartment. He entered the corridor, from which, as he knew, issued the bedchambers of the slaves. Here he stopped in sudden surprise at seeing a woman holding a light, while two men were issuing from one of the apartments bearing between them a body wrapped in a cloak. Sempronius stood by the men, directing their movements. The face of the person carried was invisible, but the light of the lamp fell upon a mass of golden brown hair, and Malchus knew at once that it was Clotilde who was being carried off. Malchus sprang forward, and, with a blow of his staff, levelled one of the slaves to the ground. Sempronius, with a furious exclamation, drew his sword and rushed at him, while the other slave, dropping his burden, closed with Malchus and threw his arms around him. For a moment Malchus felt powerless, but before Sempronius could strike, there was a deep roar. A dark body sprang forward and hurled itself upon him, levelling him to the ground with a crushing blow of its paw, and then seizing him by the shoulder and shook him violently. The slave who had held Malchus loosened his hold and fled with a cry of affright. The female slave dropped the light and fled also. Clotilde by this time had gained her feet. Quick, love! Malchus said. Seize your disguise and join me at the back gate. Sempronius is killed. I will join you as quickly as I can. By this time the household was alarmed. The shout of Malchus and the roar of the lion had aroused everyone. 
and the slaves soon came running with lights to the spot. Malchus checked them as they came running out. Fetch the net, he said. The net in question had been procured after the lion had before made an attack upon the slave, but had not since been required. Malchus dared not approach the creature now, for, although he was not afraid for himself, it was now furious, and might, if disturbed, rush among the others and do terrible destruction before it could be secured. The net was quickly brought, and Malchus, with three of the most resolute of the slaves, advanced and threw it over the lion, which was lying upon the prostrate body of Sempronius. It sprang to its feet, but the net was round it, and in its struggle to escape it fell on its side. Another twist of the net, and it was helplessly enclosed. The four men lifted the ends and carried it away. Cutting a portion of the net, Malchus placed the massive iron collar attached to the chain around its neck and left it, saying to the others, We can cut the rest of the net off it afterwards. Then he hurried back to the scene of the struggle. Flavia was already there. What is all this, Malchus? she asked. Here I find Sempronius dead and one of his slaves senseless beside him. They tell me when he first arrived you were here. I know nothing of it, lady, Malchus replied, save that the lion aroused me by growling, and thinking that robbers might have entered the house, I arose and searched it and came upon three men. One I leveled to the ground with my staff. Doubtless he is only stunned, and will be able to tell you more when he recovers. I grappled with another, and while engaged in a struggle with him, the third attacked me with a sword, and would have slain me had not the lion sprang upon him and felled him. The other man then fled, and that is all I know about it. What can it all mean? Flavia said. What could Sempronius, with two slaves, be doing in my house after midnight? It is a grave outrage, and there will be a terrible scandal in Rome tomorrow. The son of a praetor and a friend of the house. She then ordered the slaves to raise the body of Sempronius and carry it to a couch and to send at once for a leech. She also bade them throw water on the slave and bring him to consciousness, and then to bring him before her to be questioned. Where is my daughter? she said suddenly. Has she not been roused by all this stir? One of the female slaves stole into Julia's apartment, and returned saying that her mistress was sound asleep on her couch. An expression of doubt crossed Flavia's face, but she only said, Do not disturb her, and then thoughtfully returned to her room. It was not until an hour later that the prisoner was sufficiently recovered to be brought before Flavia. He had already heard that his master was killed, and, knowing that concealment would be useless, he threw himself on the ground before Flavia, and owned that he and another slave had been brought by Sempronius to carry off a slave girl. Acting on his instructions, they had thrust a kerchief into her mouth, and wrapped a cloak around her, and were carrying her off when a man rushed at him, and he supposed struck him, for he remembered nothing more. And then, with many tears, implored mercy, on the ground that he was acting but on his master's orders. At this moment the praetor himself arrived, Flavia having sent for him immediately that she had ascertained that Sempronius was dead. He was confused and bewildered at the suddenness of his loss. I thought at first, Flavia said, that he must have been engaged in some wild scheme to carry off Julia, though why he should do so I could not imagine, seeing that he had my approval of his wooing. But Julia is asleep not having been wakened by the noise of the scuffle. It must have been one of the slave girls. Ah! she exclaimed suddenly. I did not see Clotilde. She struck a bell, and her attendant entered. Go, she said, and summon Clotilde here. In a few minutes the slave returned, saying that Clotilde was not to be found. She may have been carried off by the other slave, Flavia said. But Malchus was there, and he would have pursued. Fetch him here. But Malchus, too, 
was found to be missing. They must have fled together, Flavia said. There was an understanding between them. Doubtless, Malchus feared that this affair with your son might cause him to be taken away from here. Perhaps it is best so, and I trust that they may get away, but I fear that there is little chance, since no slaves are allowed to leave the city without a pass, and even did they succeed in gaining the open country, they would be arrested and brought back by the first person who met them. But that is not the question for the present. What think you, my friend? What are we to do in this terrible business? I know not, said the praetor with a groan. The honour of both our families is concerned, Flavia said calmly. Your son has been found in my house at night and slain by my lion. All the world knows that he was a suitor for Julia's hand. There's but one thing to be done. The matter must be kept secret. It would not do to remove Sempronius tonight, for the litter might be stopped by the watch. It must be taken boldly away in daylight. Send four slaves whom you can trust, and order them to be silent on pain of death. I will tell my household that if a word is breathed of what has taken place tonight, I will hand whoever disobeys me over to the executioners. When you have got your son's body home, you can spread a rumour that he is sick of the fever. There will be no difficulty in bribing the leech. Then, in a few days, you will give out that he is dead, and none will be any the wiser. The praetor agreed that this was the best plan that could be adopted, and it was carried out in due course, and so well was the secret kept that no one in Rome ever doubted that Sempronius had fallen victim to a fever. Julia's anger in the morning when she heard that the Gaulish slave girl and the Carthaginian were missing was great, and she hurried to her mother's room to demand that a hue and cry should be at once made for them and a reward offered for their apprehension. She had, when informed of the scenes which had taken place in the night and of the death of Sempronius, expressed great astonishment and horror, and indeed the news that her accomplice had been killed had really shocked her. The sentiment, however, had faded to insignificance in the anger which she felt when, as the narrative continued, she heard of the escape of the two slaves. A stormy scene took place between her and her mother, Julia boldly avowing that she was the author of the scheme which had had so fatal a termination. Flavia, in her indignation at her daughter's conduct, sent her away at once to a small summer retreat belonging to her in the hills and there she was kept for some months in the strict seclusion under the watchful guardianship of some old and trusted slaves. Malchus, having seen the lion fastened up, had seized the bundle containing his disguise and hurried away to the gate where Clotilde was awaiting him. "'How long have you been?' she said with a gasp of relief. "'I could not get away until the lion was secured,' he said for I should have been instantly missed. Now we will be off at once. Both had thrown large cloaks over their garments, and they now hurried along through the deserted streets, occasionally drawing aside into by-lanes as they heard the tramp of the city watch. At last, after half an hour's walking, they reached the wall. Malchus knew the exact spot where he had hidden the rope, and had no difficulty in finding it. They mounted the steps and stood on the battlements. The centuries were far apart, for no enemy was in the neighbourhood of Rome. Malchus fastened the rope around Clotilde and lowered her down over the battlements. When he found she had reached the ground, he made fast the end of the rope and slid down till he stood beside her. They proceeded with the utmost caution until at some distance from the walls and then shaped their course until, after a long walk, they came down upon the Tiber below the city. Day had by this time broken, and Malchus bade Clotilde enter a little wood to change her garments and dye her skin. He then proceeded to do the same, and, rolling up the clothes he had taken off, hid them under a bush. Clotilde soon joined him again. She wore the dress of a peasant boy, consisting of a tunic of rough cloth reaching to her knees. 
her limbs face and neck were dyed a sunny brown and her hair which was cut quite short was blackened dyes were largely in use by the roman ladies and malchus had no difficulty in procuring those necessary for their disguises i don't think any one would suspect you clotilde he said even i should pass you without notice what a pity you have had to part with all your sunny hair it will soon grow again she said and now malchus do not let us waste a moment i am in terror while those dark walls are in sight we shall soon leave them behind malchus said encouragingly there are plenty of fishermen's boats moored along the bank here we shall soon leave rome behind us they stepped into a boat loosened the moorings and pushed off and malchus getting out the oars rowed steadily down the river until they neared its mouth then they landed pushed the boat into the stream again lest if it were found fastened up it might give a clue to any who were in pursuit of them and then struck off into the country after travelling some miles they turned into a wood where they lay down for several hours and did not resume their course until nightfall malchus had before starting entered the kitchen and filled a bag with cold meat oatmeal cakes and other food and this when examined proved ample for four days supply and he had therefore no occasion to enter the villages to buy provisions they kept to the seashore until they neared terracina and then took to the hills and skirted these until they had left the state of latium they kept along at the foot of the great range which forms the backbone of italy and so passing along samnium came upon the volturnus having thus avoided the roman army which lay between capua and rome their journey had been a rough one for by the winding road they had followed along the mountains the distance they traversed was over one hundred miles the fatigue had been great and it was well that clotilde had a gaulish training after their provisions were exhausted they had subsisted upon corn which they had gathered in the patches of cultivated ground near the mountain villages and upon fruits which they picked in the woods twice too they had come upon the herds of half wild goats in the mountain and malchus had succeeded in knocking down a kid with a stone they had not made very long journeys resting always for a few hours in the heat of the day and it was ten days after they had left rome before from an eminence they saw the walls of capua how can i go in like this clotilde exclaimed with a sudden fit of shyness we will wait until it is dusk malchus said the dye is fast wearing off and your arms are strangely white for a peasant girl's i will take you straight to hannibal's palace and you will soon be fitted out gorgeously there are spoils enough stored up to clothe all the women of rome they sat down in the shade of a clump of trees and waited till the heat of the day was past then they rose and walked on until after darkness had fallen they entered the town of capua they had no difficulty in discovering the palace where hannibal was lodged they were stopped at the entrance by the guards who gave a cry of surprise and pleasure when malchus revealed himself at first they could hardly credit that in the dark-skinned peasant their own commander stood before them and as the news spread rapidly the officers of the corps ran down and saluted him with joyous greeting while this was going on clotilde shrank back out of the crowd as soon as he could extricate himself from his comrades malchus joined her and led her to hannibal who hearing the unusual stir was issuing from his apartment to see what had occasioned it the shouts of long live malchus which rose from the soldiers informed him of what had happened and he at once recognized his kinsman in the figure advancing to meet him my dear malchus he exclaimed this is a joyous surprise i have been in vain endeavoring to get you out of the hands of the romans but they were obstinate in refusing an exchange but knowing your adroitness i have never given up hopes of seeing you appear some day among us but whom have you here he asked as he re-entered the room accompanied by malchus and his companion 
This is Clotilda, daughter of Allobrigius, the chief of the Orcan tribe, Malchus replied, and my affianced wife. Her father has been defeated and killed by Posthumus, and she was carried as a slave to Rome. There good fortune and the gods threw us together, and I have managed to bring her with me. I remember you, of course, Hannibal said to the girl, and that I joked my young kinsman about you. It is well indeed, but we must see at once about providing you with proper garments. There are no females in my palace, but I will send at once for Chalcus, who is now captain of my guard, and who has married here in Capua, and beg him to bring hither his wife. She will, I am sure, take charge of you, and furnish you with garments. Clotilde was soon handed over to the care of the Italian lady, and Malchus then proceeded to relate to Hannibal the various incidents which had occurred since he had sailed from Capua for Sardinia. He learned in return that the mission of Mago to Carthage had been unsuccessful. He had brought over a small reinforcement of cavalry and elephants, which had landed in Brutium, and had safely joined the army. But this only repaired a few of the many gaps made by the war, and was useless to enable Hannibal to carry out his great purpose. Hanno's influence was too strong, Hannibal said, and I foresee that sooner or later the end must come. I may hold out for years here in southern Italy, but unless Carthage rises from her lethargy, I must finally be overpowered. It seems to me, Malchus said, that the only hope is in rousing the Gauls to invade Italy from the north. I know nothing of what is passing there, Hannibal said, but it is clear from the disaster which has befallen our friends the Orcans that the Romans are more than holding their own north of the Apennines. Still, if a diversion could be made, it would be useful. I suppose you are desirous of taking your bride back to her tribe? Such is my wish, certainly. Malchus said, as I have told you, Hannibal, I have made up my mind never to return to Carthage. It is hateful to me. Her tame submission to the intolerable tyranny of Hanno and his faction, her sufferance of the corruption which reigns in every department, her base ingratitude to you and the army, which have done and suffered so much, the lethargy which she betrays when dangers are thickening and her fall and destruction are becoming more and more sure have sickened me of her. I have resolved, as I have told you, to cast her off, and to live and die among the Gauls, a life rough and simple, but at least free. But it seems the Gauls have again been subjected to Rome, Hannibal said. On this side of the Alps, Malchus replied, but beyond there are great tribes who have never as yet heard of Rome. It is to them that Clotilde's mother belongs and we have settled that we will first try and find her mother and persuade her to go with us, and that if she is dead we will journey alone until we join her tribe in Germany. But before I go, if it would be possible, try and rouse the Gauls to make another effort for freedom by acting in concert, by driving out the Romans and invading Italy. You will, I trust, Hannibal not oppose my plans. Assuredly not, Malchus. I sympathize with you, and were I younger and without ties and responsibilities, I would fain do the same. It is a sacrifice, no doubt, to give up civilization and to begin life anew. But it is what our colonists are always doing. At any rate, it is freedom. Freedom from the corruption of the intrigue, the sloth, and the littleness of the decaying power like that of Carthage. You will be happy, at least, in having your wife with you, while the gods only know when I shall see the face of my beloved Emilce. Yes, Malchus, follow your own devices. Carthage, when she flung you in prison and would have put you to such a disgraceful death, forfeited all further claim upon you. You have rendered her great services. You have risked your life over and over again in her cause. You have repaid tenfold the debt which you incurred when she gave you birth. You are free now to carry your sword where you will. I shall deeply regret your loss, 
but your father has gone and many another true friend of mine and it is but one more in the list of those that i have lost follow your own wishes and live in that freedom which you will never attain in the service of carthage the next day the marriage of malchus and clotilde took place hannibal himself joined their hands and prayed the gods to bless their union three weeks later hannibal arranged that a body of a hundred carthaginian horse should accompany malchus to the north where he would endeavour to raise the gaulish tribes they were to cross into apulia and travel up the east coast until past the ranges of the apennines and then make their way across the plains to the alps a dozen officers accompanied him and these were to aid him in his negotiations with the chiefs and in organizing the new forces should his efforts be successful to the great joy of malchus on the very evening before he started nessus arrived in the camp he had when malchus was at home been employed with the other carthaginian soldiers on the fortifications malchus had once or twice seen him as with the others he was marched from prison to the walls and had exchanged a few words with him he had told him that he intended to escape but could not say when he should find an opportunity to do so but that if at any time a month passed without his seeing him nessus would know that he had gone the extra rigour with which the prisoners were guarded had led nessus to suspect that a prisoner had escaped and a month having passed without his seeing malchus he determined on making an attempt at flight so rigorous was the watch that there was no possibility of this being done secretly and therefore one day when they were employed in repairing the foundations of the wall outside the city nessus seized the opportunity when the attention of the guards was for a moment directed in another quarter to start at the top of his speed he had chosen the hottest hour of the day for the attempt when few people were about and the peasants had left the fields for an hour's sleep under the shade of the trees the roman guard had started in pursuit but nessus had not overrated his powers gradually he left them behind him and making straight for the tiber plunged in and swam the river he had followed the right bank up to the hills and on the second evening after starting made his appearance at capua when he heard the plans of malchus he announced as a matter of course that he should accompany him malchus pointed out that with the rewards and spoils he had obtained he had now sufficient money to become a man of importance among his own people nessus quietly waved the remark aside as if it were wholly unworthy of consideration the cavalry who were to accompany malchus were light armed numidians whose speed would enable them to distance any bodies of the enemy they might meet on their way with them were thirty lead horses some of them carrying a large sum of money which hannibal had directed should be paid to malchus from the treasury as his share as an officer of high rank of the captured booty the rest of the horses were laden with costly arms robes of honour and money as presents for the gaulish chiefs these also were furnished from the abundant spoils which had fallen into the hands of the carthaginians hannibal directed malchus that in the event of his failing in his mission he was not to trouble to send these things back but was to retain them to win the friendship and good will of the chiefs of the country to which he proposed to journey the next morning malchus took an affectionate farewell of the general and his old comrades and then with clotilde riding by his side for the women of gaul were as well skilled as the men in the management of horses he started at the head of his party he followed the route marked out for him without any adventure of importance he had one or two skirmishes with parties of tribesmen allied with rome but his movements were too rapid for any force sufficient to oppose his passage being collected after ascending the sea coast the troops skirted the northern slopes of the apennines passing close to the battlefield of trebia and crossing the po by a ford ascended the banks of the orcus and reached clotilda's native village a few ruins alone marked where it had stood 
Malchus halted there and dispatched scouts far up the valley. These succeeded in finding a native, who informed them that Brunilda, with the remains of the tribe, were living in the forest far up the slopes. The scouts delivered to them the message with which they were charged, that Clotilde and Malchus, with a Carthaginian force, were at Orca. The following evening, Brunilda and her followers came into camp. Deep was the joy of the mother and daughter. The former had long since given up all hope of ever hearing of Clotilde again, and had devoted her life to vengeance on the Romans. From her fastness in the mountain, she had from time to time led her followers down, and carried fire and sword over the fields and plantations of the Roman colonists, retiring rapidly before the garrisons could sally from the towns and fall upon her. She was rejoiced to find that her child had found a husband and a protector in the young Carthaginian, still more rejoiced when she found that the latter had determined upon throwing in his lot with the Gauls. All that night mother and daughter sat talking over the events which had happened since they parted. Brunilda could give Malchus but little encouragement for the mission on which he had come. The legion of Postumius had indeed been defeated, and nearly destroyed in a rising which had taken place early in the spring. But fresh troops had arrived. Dissensions had, as usual, broken out among the chiefs. Many of them had again submitted to the Romans, and the rest had been defeated and crushed. Brunilda thought there was little hope at present of their again taking up arms. For some weeks Malchus attempted to carry out Hannibal's instructions. He and his lieutenants accompanied by small parties of horse, rode through the country, and visited all the chiefs of Cisalpine Gaul. But the spirit of the people was broken. The successes they had gained had never been more than partial. The Roman garrison towns had always defied their efforts, and sooner or later the Roman legions swept down across the Apennines and carried all before them. In vain, Malchus told them of the victories that Hannibal had won, that southern Italy was in his hands and the Roman dominion tottering. In reply they pointed to the garrison and the legion, and said that, were Rome in a sore strait, she would recall her legion for her own defence, and no arguments that Malchus could use could move them to lay aside their own differences and to unite in another effort for freedom. Winter was now at hand. Malchus remained in the mountains with the Orcans until spring came, and then renewed his efforts with no greater success than before. Then he dismissed the Carthaginians with a letter, giving Hannibal an account of all he had done, and bade them find their way back to Capua by the road by which they had come. Brunilda had joyfully agreed to his proposal that they should cross the Alps and join her kinsmen in Germany and the remnant of the tribe willingly consented to accompany them. Accordingly, in the month of May, they set out, and journeying north made their way along the shore of the lake now called Lago di Guada, and crossing by the pass of the Trentino came down on the northern side of the Alps, and after journeying for some weeks among the great forests which covered the country, reached the part inhabited by the tribe of the Cherusai, to which Brunelda belonged. Here they were hospitably received. Brunelda's family were among the noblest of the tribe, and the rich presents which the ample resources of Malchus enabled him to distribute among all the chiefs at once raised him to a position of high rank and consideration among them. Although accepting the life of barbarism, Malchus was not prepared to give up all the usages of civilization. He built a house, which, although it would have been but a small structure in Carthage, was regarded with admiration and wonder by the Gauls. Here he introduced the usages and customs of civilization. The walls, indeed, of being hung with silk and tapestry, were covered with the skins of stags, bears, and other animals slain in the chase. But, these were warmer and better suited for the rigour of the climate in winter than silks would have been. The wealth, 
knowledge and tact of Malchus gained him an immense influence in the tribe, and in time he was elected the chief of that portion of it dwelling near him. He did not succeed in getting his followers to abandon their own modes of life, but he introduced among them many of the customs of civilization, and persuaded them to adopt the military formation in use among the Carthaginians. It was with some reluctance that they submitted to this, but so complete was the victory which they obtained over a rival tribe upon their first encounter when led by Malchus and his able lieutenant Nessus, that he had no difficulty in future on the score. The advantages, indeed, of fighting in solid formation instead of the irregular order in which each man fought for himself were so overwhelming that the tribe rapidly increased in power and importance, and became one of the leading peoples in that part of Germany. Above all, Malchus inculcated them with a deep hatred of Rome, and warned them that when the time came, as it assuredly would do, that the Romans would cross the Alps and attempt the conquest of the country. It behooved the German tribes to lay aside their disputes and join in a common resistance against the enemy. From time to time, rumours brought by parties of Cisalpine Gauls, who, like the Orcans, fled across the Alps to escape the tyranny of Rome, reached Malchus. For years the news came that no great battle had been fought, that Hannibal was still in the south of Italy defeating all the efforts of the Romans to dislodge him. It was not until the thirtieth year after Hannibal had crossed the Alps that any considerable reinforcement was sent to aid the Carthaginian general. Then his brother, Hasdrubal, having raised an army in Spain and southern Gaul, crossed the Alps to join him. But he was met, as he marched south, by the consuls Livius and Nero, with an army greater superior to his own, and was crushed by them on the river Matorus, the Spanish and Ligurian troops being annihilated, and Hasdrubal himself killed. For four years longer, Hannibal maintained his position in the south of Italy. No assistance whatsoever reached him from Carthage. But alone and unaided, he carried on the unequal war with Rome, until, in 204 BC, Scipio landed with a Roman force within a few miles of Carthage, captured Utica, defeated two Carthaginian armies with great slaughter, and blockaded Carthage. Then the city recalled the general and the army whom they had so grossly neglected and betrayed. Hannibal succeeded in safely embarking his army and in sailing to Carthage. But so small was the remnant of the force which remained to him, that when he attempted to give battle to Scipio, he was defeated, and Carthage was forced to make peace on terms which left her for the future at the mercy of Rome. She was to give up all her ships of war except ten, and all her elephants, to restore all Roman prisoners, to engage in no war out of Africa, and none in Africa except with the consent of Rome, to restore to Massinissa, a prince of Numidia who had joined Rome, his kingdom, to pay a contribution of two hundred talents a year for fifty years, and to give a hundred hostages between the ages of fourteen and thirty, to be selected by a Roman general. These terms left Carthage at the mercy of Rome, when the latter, confident in her power, entered upon the Third Punic War. The overthrow and the destruction of her rival were a comparatively easy task for her. Hannibal lived nineteen years after his return to Carthage. For eight years he strove to rectify the administration, to reform abuses, and to raise and improve the state. But his exposure of the gross abuses of the public service united against him the faction which had so long profited by them. And in B.C. 196, the great patriot and general was driven into exile. He then repaired to the court of Antiochus, king of Syria, who was at that time engaged in a war against Rome. But that monarch would not follow the advice he gave him, and was in consequence defeated at Magnesia, and was forced to sue for peace and accept the terms the Romans imposed, one of which was that Hannibal 
should be delivered into their hands. Hannibal, being warned in time, left Syria and went to Bithynia, but Rome could not be easy so long as her great enemy lived, and made a demand upon Prusias, king of Bithynia, for his surrender. He was about to comply with the request when Hannibal put an end to his life, dying at the age of sixty-four. No rumour of this event ever reached Malchus, but he heard, fifteen years after he passed into Germany, that Hannibal had at last retired from Italy, and had been defeated at Zama, and that Carthage had been obliged to submit to conditions which placed her at the mercy of Rome. Malchus rejoiced more than ever at the choice he had made. His sons were now growing up, and he spared no efforts to instil in them a hatred and distrust of Rome, to teach them the tactics of war, and to fill their minds with noble and lofty thoughts. Nessus had followed the example of his lord, and had married a Gaulish maiden, and he was now a sub-chief of the tribe. Malchus and Clotilde lived to a great age, and the former never once regretted the choice he had made. From afar, he heard of the ever-growing power of Rome, and warned his grandsons as he had warned his sons against her, and begged them to impress upon their descendants in turn the counsels he had given them. The injunction was observed, and the time came when Arminius, a direct descendant of Malchus, then the leader of the Cheruzzi, assembled the German tribes and fell upon the legions of Varus, inflicting upon them a defeat as crushing and terrible as the Romans had ever suffered at the hands of Hannibal himself, and checking for once and all the efforts of the Romans to subdue the free people of Germany. The End End of chapter 22 Recording by Ravi Shankar End of the Young Carthaginian A Story of the Life and Times of Hannibal by George Alfred Henty